You're on. Um, I don't know why that didn't play music. Hello and welcome. <laughs> yeah, I, I was expecting, hopefully you guys could hear something because I didn't hear anything. But hello and welcome to the Transatlantic Call-In Show. This is the show where you get to call in and talk to two real live, I know, shocking trans people about anything and everything trans. Uh, so whether you are an ally who's maybe a little confused about certain things or whether you think that trans people can't even exist, it doesn't make sense. We want to talk to you and hear what you have to say hopefully give you some uh, better arguments. Uh, I am your host, Arden Hart. I forgot my name there for a second. And with me today <laughs> is nominal Naomi. Hey, Naomi. Hello, hello. Really glad to be hosting. So thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we're so excited to have you. Do uh, you want to tell the chat a little bit about you and what you do? Because, uh, I mean, I'm sure some of them know who you are, but Absolutely. So I, I'm a PhD student and on the side, I do a lot of streaming content over on Twitch and TikTok. I'm actually live on Twitch right now, twitch.tv slash nominal Naomi. If you Google my name, you will find all of my links and stuff. I also upload things to YouTube. So if you want to hear more about kind of leftist politics, the focus on queer rights, that's kind of my area of expertise. And I do debate style convos. So really, really glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me again. Yeah, awesome. Well, you'll be a great fit. So uh, we love to to get into the brawling a little bit for here from time to time when we can. Uh, but yeah, so uh, if you know what we do here, we go through uh, some polls at the beginning of our show to talk about some relevant trans issues. So uh, first, we're going to talk about last week's poll and the results, and uh, then we'll go on to next, this week's poll. So can we bring that up? Looks like we've already got callers on the line, too, so we're going to have a nice full show. So last week's poll... Do you talk about culture war issues with your family IRL? Yes or no? Uh, looks like we got about 56% yes, 44% no. Um, that's pretty good. Uh, I mean, I think this is kind of was relating to uh, like after um, Michael Knowles at CPAC had made his statement about, you know, eradicating transgenderism from public life entirely. It was kind of pressing on like, I realize for a lot of people talking about these issues to your family and your loved ones are probably a little bit difficult or tense. It's not always easy to, you know, be getting in a fight over Thanksgiving dinner, uh, but it's also kind of important at the same time. So I was just kind of curious how many of our audience, how much of our audience was actually initiating those conversations with their family. And I think that's probably a pretty healthy number. I mean, more than half, yeah. but... Uh, yeah, what do you think? I'm really, you... I'm really curious uh, how that poll would look kind of broken down by like the political leanings of the parents. I think that would probably have like a big factor on that, but good good to see a majority. Yes, I think that talking about these things is really awesome. I, I love to see engagement. Yeah, definitely. No, that would be interesting. I mean, we've, we've done some more like broken down polls before, but sometimes those don't always get as many reactions. And with this one, we can generate at least more conversation in the comments. So yeah, so thank you guys for voting on that poll and be sure you are checking out this week's poll when we bring it up right now. Uh, so this week's poll, <laughs> extra spicy here today. Uh, do you think gender dysphoria is mental illness? And your options are no, I agree with the World Health Organization, <laughs> or yes, I oppose the experts. So we kind of gave you some loaded answers, but that's because that's what we do here. <laughs> we like to troll a little bit. Um, but this is also kind of relating to uh, much love to Abigail Thorne. No, no hate. I know this kind of spurred on, she made a uh, response to a post and it spurred on some discourse on Twitter about uh, the validity of gender dysphoria as like a diagnosis. Um, because, you know, when we see the same behaviors in cis people seeking breast augmentations or hairline advancements, we don't consider that a mental health issue or diagnosable. It's just what people do. They seek to affirm their gender. But when it comes to trans people, it's heavily medicalized. And while I think there is some utility to gender dysphoria, like we have predictive models for treatment that are based around this concept of gender dysphoria. There definitely is times where uh, it's used to gatekeep people out of healthcare. So I don't know, what, how, how, do you, how does this poll make you feel, Naomi? Yeah, I, I think that kind of, asking like whether or not it is or is not a mental disorder paints this very like binarized view of the question. When I, I think that when it comes to something like mental illness, it's a little bit more helpful to think of it less of this kind of like strict binary between mental illness or not, where when we kind of think of mental illness, we're thinking of something that causes clinically significant distress or disability. And there are so many different shades of gender dysphoria where there are, there are trans people that experience, you know, very crippling amounts of distress. And 
I think that that could certainly reach a medicalized point, but there's also lots more mild gender dysphoria, and, and even the types of ones you explain that cis people can experience, like the kind that cause them to, to seek those breast augmentations or hairline uh, transplants, for example. And so I think that if we recognize that this kind of gender dysphoria exists along a spectrum, trying to delineate exactly whether or not, you know, one point reaches a mental illness or not, paints this binaryized kind of view where people tend to think of like, there's this transgender dysphoria that's completely different than all these other gender dysphorias and discomfort around gender. When I think that kind of just thinking of it more of a spectrum and, and less of a strictly medicalized thing just allows for some greater nuance in general. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, definitely, like, I, I know um, we, we've talked a lot about kind of, we actually had a caller call in, and I hope they call back uh, this week who wanted to talk about, they kind of had the position that if you don't have gender dysphoria, you're not trans. And I know that's always been a hot button topic in, in the community. And I, I hope they call back. So I would love to talk to them about that. Um, but I felt like this kind of kind of expanded on that idea too. It's very prevalent in the community. And so I think it's interesting to generate conversation around that and hear what people have to say. So if you're ready. We've got three callers already on the line. The number is down in the uh, beneath our names there. Also, the mods are always spamming it in the chat. So please give us a call. We would love to talk to you. First, if you're ready, we've got, uh, we're going to take Pamela in Victoria, Australia. No pronouns given. Pamela, you're live on Transatlantic. What's going on? Hello, hello. Hello. Pamela, are you there? Oh, okay. no. <laughs> we're going to put Pamela in the queue. Uh, to double check that that's uh, not something on our end, we're going to pull in another caller. <clears throat> and if that's an issue, then it's probably on our end. So let's bring in, uh, how about we bring in Simon in Germany, pronouns are he, him. Uh, Simon, you are on the line. What's going on? Oh, I think I heard Simon. something in the background, but no Simon. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Ooh, okay. That was my bad. Uh, I'll figure it out. They're apparently not hearing us. Give me a minute Simon, and you'll talk Simon about does not say. ice cream or something. <laughs> Simon does not say, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I keep muting my mic because I'm actually recovering from pretty severe cough. Not COVID somehow. For three years in, I still have managed to not catch COVID, but I've got a pretty severe cough right now. So I'm like drinking a giant, this is a liter bottle of Pedialyte. <laughs> so I'm trying to keep myself <laughs> hydrated. Ready to connect. Moment. Click connect to show now. Okay, so we're reconnecting our call in studio right now. Hopefully that will refresh everyone. Uh, let me know, Jimmy, when we are good to connect a caller so you can give them a shot. Um, but uh, Naomi, yeah, go ahead and try again. Oh, okay, all right. Let's bring in Pamela again in Victoria. Pamela, All right. you are live on the line. What's going on? Hi there. There we go. Hello. Awesome. Hi. What's up? What's your what would you like to talk about today? Uh yeah, I, well, I just um I put down initially that I wanted to talk about the idea of bodies being wronged and get you to defend that. But having listened to like the start of your conversation, I think it's interesting you say cis people wanting to change their bodies isn't seen as a mental illness. Like, what about like anorexia? What about all the discussions in feminism about women not liking their bodies and trying to promote body positivity? Is that not framing cis people wanting to change their bodies as a mental illness? Yeah, so you bring up an interesting point. There definitely are uh, situations and conditions for cis people that revolve around like their body image and things like this that could be categorized as mental illness. Um, I mean, there are definitely people who are considered to have body dysmorphic disorder who seek or chronically desire like surgery. You're right. That is a thing. And I think it's definitely important to be critical of what kind of surgeries are popular and commonplace and why those trends exist. That's all totally valid. But what I'm talking about is there are many people, many women who might seek out a breast augmentation and nothing else. So it was their only insecurity. They treated it with a breast augmentation and then they're happier for it. They have a more, they consider their life more fulfilling and they just go on with that. And nobody thinks of that as a mental illness. That is kind of what we're talking about. Um, but I definitely think there's room for 
a critical conversation around like the feminist values of why those people seek that and why that makes them feel more comfortable. Like probably arguably because we live in a patriarchy and being sexualized is like a, as a valuable social currency uh, in some sense. But I don't think it's always necessarily that. I think sometimes that's just how people want to be. Well, I think um, in terms of whether it would be seen as a mental illness, it would depend on the level of distress. Like I think if someone went up to me and was like, I'm going to kill myself if I don't get a breast augmentation, I think every reasonable person would say that's a mental illness. Probably. That, yeah, seems, so I that think would be pretty concerning. Yeah, I think that's the reason people are seeing, um, I guess, trans, uh, trans-identified people wanting to modify their body as a mental illness because they do say that sort of thing at least some of the time. Sure, but I think it's also worth kind of dissecting the reasons behind this stuff. Like, I, I can't speak for every trans person here, but my understanding excuse me, of the data and my personal experience would suggest that I, I got, I, I had gender dysphoria in some part because of the cultural values that our society has around how women ought to look. And since I identify as a woman, it was compelling for me to want to seek like facial feminization surgery and breast augmentation because that made my body conform more to the standards of women in society. Um, it wasn't because my brain was just inherently broken. Uh, or not to say that people who you know have body dysmorphia are inherently broken, but I know the treatment outcomes for body dysmorphia generally, um, it, getting those things treated, getting surgery, getting your face like fixed, so to speak, uh, does not have the same efficacy as it does when we're talking about treating gender dysphoria. So I think there's probably a different internal motivation going on there, which is why it might be considered mental illness in one situation and not in another. Um, but yeah, I, I think that this is kind of, kind of something that's like really un- counterintuitive with medicine in general is that we have so many different things that are either medical conditions or maybe just some kind of more mild distress, and they respond to lots of different treatments in lots of different ways, sometimes even unintuitively. And at the end of the day, what I care most about is reducing harm and improving human well-being. And so if the you know medical guidelines and standards for treating somebody that has anorexia are vastly different than treating somebody that has gender dysphoria, for example, then I'm okay with that. At the end of the day, I just want to reduce harm. And human brains, the the congruence between the brain and the body is a really, really complicated thing. And it doesn't really surprise me after kind of thinking about it a bit that, you know, our, our brains would interpret the kind of things which lead to body dysmorphia versus gender dysphoria versus anorexia versus all these other conditions very differently. And it's going to be very different treatments that are going to do the most good for the most people. And that's just what I care about at the end of the day, is doing the most good, reducing the most harm that we can. Great. Okay, so I I guess, because you seem to be implying there's a double standard, I'm trying to figure out where the double standard is, because I feel anyone who was profoundly distressed with their body would, whether they were trans identified or not, would be considered to have a mental illness. Um, That's how I'd see it, at least. Okay, so... Maybe the the issue that I'm seeing here is that what we do these polls, right? They are admittedly salacious. They're they're supposed to be provocative to evoke responses. Um, I, I'm not particularly wed one way or another to the term mental illness. I, mental illness, there there's utility in using that term. There are definitely like a group of conditions that afflict the human that are probably usefully described as mental illnesses, but. At the end of the day, much like Naomi is saying, where the line is for you know gender dysphoria or or anorexia or, or body dysmorphia or something like that is not really as important as what the treatment outcomes are. So, uh, if you're saying there's we are employing a double standard in considering you know body dysmorphia mental illness and not gender dysphoria, my my point that I'm trying to convey to you and maybe haven't done successfully is that. Uh, the term mental illness is maybe not the most useful here. And you, you asked, like, um, for example, what would we consider someone who's like, I'm going to kill myself if I don't get this breast augmentation, a cis woman mentally ill? It's like, uh, my gut reaction is yes, absolutely. But if it ends up the case that 
uh, that actually is good for their quality of life and improves their outcomes and that it's not actually really useful at all to think about it as a mental illness. I'm perfectly capable of dropping that language and, and just adapting to whatever the evidence shows is the best for that individual. Is that helpful? Okay. I guess, so would you also consider, I guess, a, tra a biological male, a trans identified who wanted to get breast implants, who, ha who was also, I will commit suicide if I don't get breast implants. So basically the same as our cis woman, but biologically male, um, you're saying, would that person also have a, I know you don't, maybe don't like the term mental illness, but like, what's your justification for labeling them differently? So I don't know if we necessarily need to like, label them differently. I think that kind of the gut reaction in both cases is, I mean, if somebody is threatening suicide over something, for example, kind of the gut reaction is say that that's a mental illness. But regardless, I would want to treat that person with the treatments which are shown to have the best outcome for their mental health. And if it's shown that for, for a cis woman, getting a breast implant is what's going to improve her mental health, improve her overall well-being, then yeah, we should allow her to get that treatment. If it's shown for a trans woman that getting a breast augmentation is going to improve her mental health, improve her overall well-being, I would much rather have that than her killing herself. Uh, although this is kind of like a very extreme example, obviously. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I, I've probably... And it's shown that for, for a cis woman, getting a breast implant is what's Sorry. Oh, sorry. That audio started coming out of my phone out of nowhere. My bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that totally drew my train of thought. Um, I was going to say, uh, uh, yeah, I think I've, I've screwed this conversation a little bit. Uh, and bringing up the word mental illness in and of itself is probably a mistake. Um, I, I, my, my, the point I'm trying to get at is that calling one or the other mental illness is kind of irrelevant. Like the, the treatment outcomes are what's meaningful. And I, I'm, I'm definitely not maybe fumbling on communicating that. So if that's the case, I'm sorry. No, I think, I think I've got it. I guess, um, I know like a lot of trans identified people don't like being labeled as mentally ill. It's just, um. I find that a bit odd, considering that does also happen to cis people. I, I don't think it's like people are rushing to label trans people as mentally ill. I think if you display symptoms of mental illness, like, you know, like extreme examples saying you'll kill yourself if you don't get this body change, or you're profoundly distressed if you don't get this body change, I think that's what's causing people to label like a trans identified people as mentally ill to say, exhibit that kind of behavior, um, I think, somewhat more often than, like, uh, cis women who want to change their bodies. Sure. Um, I, I agree that it probably, it could look like that to someone who's maybe uh, uh, just taking a cursory glance at the issues, but would you agree that if both the cis person and the trans person, the outcomes show that their quality of life improved dramatically and they were more able to function in their, you know, their work and their social life after getting these surgeries, um, that it would be then in the best interest of everyone, everyone in society included, not just the individual, for those people to get those surgeries? Well, I think, okay, in terms of how I would treat both people, I think they should both, like, receive, especially if they're saying they're going to kill themselves, they should get, like, mental health um, treatment before they get any kind of surgery, because in my mind, if somebody is like that emotional about getting the surgery i think there's it, in my view like that very extreme emotional state sort of undermines their ability to give informed consent and so they should get some kind of mental health treatment to ensure it's the best option for them before they get surgery so that's the world we live in right now for trans affirming surgeries you're required to get multiple mental health letters according to the wpath standards and these have been updated very recently, and it still requires uh, mental health letters in order to receive surgeries. And, the, and these surgeries generally have years-long wait lists. So if, if that's the kind of world we are looking for, where we do these mental health diagnoses and, and get doctors and therapists letters, that's the world we live in right now. Yeah. And moreover, okay. yeah. I think, uh, interestingly enough, I, even if I agree with you, and I'm not necessarily sure that I do, uh, I had to get those letters for my face, right? But a cis woman who wants the exact same surgeries on her face doesn't need those letters. So it's kind of like almost what you're arguing for is more stringent rules on cis women. Is, is that like what you think ought to happen? <laughs> or cis uh, people yeah, speaking? I'd be, mm. Yeah, I'd be definitely fine with that. Um, I'm, I guess, coming at it from the standpoint of this is why I 
brought up my initial question about bodies being wrong. I'm coming at it from the standpoint of like, I want people to like their bodies without having a surgery alter them. And if we can like give uh, cis women therapy so that they'll be more confident with their bodies and they won't need to spend thousands of dollars and go through this very um, difficult medical procedure to feel good about their bodies. Like, I think that's good. I think we should absolutely give like mental health treatment to women who are um, wanting to get that kind of surgery, especially if they're showing, like I said, a lot of emotional distress, because I think that does, for me at least, it intuitively makes me question their, um, their consent. It seems you have this kind of kind of innate aversion to um, body modification once it reaches like a certain point. And I think that it's kind of interesting to explore like where that delineation point is when body modification starts to become harmful. Um, we can think of, for example, somebody who wants to become a bodybuilder, like say you've got a man who's currently kind of strawny, but he wants to put on a lot of muscle, wants to, to really beef up his body. Maybe he even takes supplements, hits the gym, all this kind of work he puts into it to, mod to modify his body. We don't typically see that as harmful in any way. Yet when we're kind of thinking about surgeries, there's more of this, this intuitive notion that, okay, well, is, is this what we want to do? And I, and I guess my question is to you, like, where do you kind of draw that line where something's going to be a, a good positive kind of body modification versus something where you're, you're kind of having some concerns or feelings about it? Because for me, I think the end goal is whether or not it helps people, how it Im impacts their mental health, how it impacts their functioning in society, in their job, things like that. And so... In kind of this case, if the bodybuilder is, is being a happy, healthy member of society, and so is the trans person in receiving their gender-affirming treatment, both of those seem very good to me. Okay, well, for me, it's, I guess it's not about surgery. Like, in the case of a bodybuilder, um, I guess I would also worry that he was, um, I guess, uh, pressured by, like, social norms into changing his body, kind of like the women getting breast implants. I think it would depend on like the mental state, I guess, of the, the man, if he was like, okay, I don't mind having this whatever kind of skinny body, but it would be nice to have a bit of muscle. I'm going to exercise and eat healthy. I think that's good. But if he was like, I must have this body or I am worthless and I will kill myself and I'm going to do some potentially extreme stuff like taking testosterone or um, steroids or just like, just if it was like, something that I would normally regard as a mental illness where there was just their entire, like, I guess, life was consumed by this and they were just, or maybe they were like, even if they weren't doing the, the like, medical treatments, if they were just exercising constantly, like, if it just seemed that they were mentally unhealthy, I'd say, yeah, they need therapy as well. I, I think everyone should have therapy, honestly. Like, <laughs> I don't necessarily disagree with that. I think probably therapy benefits most people, but I guess it's just, it's a curious thing uh, yeah, where, where your line is for what is, like, acceptable body modification and what's not. Because what if this person is extremely distressed by their body and they do go to all those lengths, but it does make them happier, healthier, and a more productive member of society, even though they're more extremely distressed by it? Is that necessarily more bad because they were motivated by a more severe distress? Well, I think that distress would be a mental illness and they should get therapy for it before they modify their body in case they end up with some, because there could be like negative consequences to doing these very extreme things. So I'd want them again to get therapy to make sure it was the right option for them. Sure. And if those, if there were demonstrably negative consequences for doing those things, I would also be opposed to them, um, which is why I'm not opposed to gender affirming care. <laughs> uh, but uh Thanks, Pamela, for your call. We do have a full line, so we're going to move on and take another call. But I appreciate you calling in. This was a good conversation. Yeah, appreciate it. Cool. Thanks so much, uh, Pamela. Yeah, I hope I gave you some insight into the genitorial perspective there. Sure. Thanks. Right. Not sure I totally caught what that word she used was at the end there, but that's all right. Um, so we've got full lines. Uh, so I want to take caller number uh, two. It's kind of related to this, actually. We're going to take Emma in Arizona. Pronouns are she, her. Emma, you are on the line. What's going on? Hi. Um, I definitely have a very similar question to the previous caller. Um, should it be required for trans people to go through a certain amount of therapy before providing hormones or body, body modifying um, care? Um, especially considering underage and trans youth. I know this is a hot topic right now. 
Yeah. Um, so I guess yeah. I was wondering what your perspectives are since I'm a cis person and um, I don't know, I haven't talked to many trans people about this. So currently, as Naomi pointed out in the last call, most trans people, even trans adults, are required for almost every gender affirming surgery to have like multiple letters from mental health professionals. And kids are in most cases required to have their parents sign off of that on top of all that. So I definitely, and the outcomes, the predictive models that we have for treatment of trans youth for gender dysphoria and things like this are pretty good. The, the odds of people being satisfied or, you know, alleviating depression and suicidal ideation and things like that are, are pretty good. Um, I, I do have concerns about gatekeeping and things like that, but at the same time, I think everyone probably benefits from some degree of counseling before they make these decisions. I think it's good to think mm -hmm. critically about the choices you're making with your body. Um, uh, as long as it's not demonstrating itself to have a like significant barrier in access to treatment, which I think it does in a lot of cases, unfortunately, I'm not inherently opposed to it. The problem is that you know you get biased therapists and professionals who are evaluating people and then maybe restricting care from them and those kind of issues do pop up. So I, yeah, I don't know, Naomi, yeah. how do you feel about that? Yeah, I think that definitely kind of drawing the line between kids and adults is pretty important here, where especially when we're talking about trans adults, it seems that the informed consent approach for hormones, for example, is very effective. Uh, adults are capable of understanding all the risks and benefits associated with medicine. I, I remember I got my informed consent letter and, and it literally laid out the options of this is all the medicine is going to do to you. It's completely optional to take it. You could just do nothing if you just want to present yourself differently socially. That's A-OK -okay too. So I think that adults are perfectly capable of, of taking something like hormones with informed consent. Uh, meanwhile, when it comes to somebody who's underage, I think that having like doctors and therapists on board just to check out, you know, that this, this trans identity is pretty solid and persistent for this, for this teen, um, that, you know, they understand everything that's going on with the medication, they understand the risks, the benefits, and, and with this team of doctors and therapists, they decide that, yes, it looks like, based on a perspective analysis, this absolutely would help out this teenager a lot. And that's actually the world that we live in right now in terms of the U.S., where under the current WPATH standards for, for trans teenagers to get puberty blockers, let alone cross-sex hormones, they have to be diagnosed with persistent gender dysphoria for six months. Um, and be going to gender therapy. And then they'll typically be on those puberty blockers for about two years max, and all the while still going to consistent gender therapy. And over that two year period, doctors and therapists can determine whether or not this person is going to benefit from hormones, exploring all their options. And in that case, after at least two and a half years of gender, dis uh, gender therapy, that's when a trans teenager can be prescribed uh, cross-sex hormones. And I, I think that this amount of um, total time of consideration of therapy, of making sure that things are persistent and, and checking off all the boxes is very good for somebody who is under the age of 18. And uh, based off of all the studies I've seen, this has been very effective in practice. Mm -hmm. Now, personally, I, I don't personally think that any, anyone under the age of 18 should be allowed to modify their body. But then again, I'm not a provider and that should definitely be you know, up to the discretion of therapists and doctors. Um, I have somebody in my life who is trans and they have recently started testosterone and they are between the ages of 18 and 20. And even though they are an adult, I have been very concerned for them. I feel like perhaps they may regret this in the future, modifying their body. And I have seen a lot of people who have regretted transitioning, especially um, female to male, and testosterone does alter your body a lot. Um, I feel like this person hasn't received enough therapy. And I mean, I haven't expressed this to this person because this is their own journey, but um, I guess I am just very concerned. I feel like there is, I mean, there are a lot of valid trans people in the world. And I don't want to take that away from anybody, but I do feel like there is kind of a culture in America right now, especially where not necessarily being trans for attention. I don't think anybody would alter their body or them socially for attention, but more, how do I put this? Uh, it's more of a band-aid, you know? Sure. Um, so I can appreciate that 
you know, maybe having a personal reservation about uh, uh, certain things, but recognizing that uh, you are not a health provider. And I I will say that, you know, when it comes to the evidence on regret rates for transition, it's actually like extraordinarily low, especially when compared to a lot of other medical uh, interventions that we consider very commonplace. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like prostatectomies and and knee replacements and things like this have extraordinarily high regret rates. But I don't see people talking about being concerned about their grandpa. You know, if he's going to regret his knee replacement very often. And yet, people say that mm-hmm. a lot about trans individuals when the evidence doesn't really seem to suggest that the regret rates are that high. And when you say you've heard a lot of cases, I, I hear this a lot, but usually they are the same cases that everyone's pointing to. And let, let's say like 2% of people regret, right? That is the high end of the estimations that I've seen in the data. I think there's like 2.6 or something like that too, but let's say 2%, right? Um, mm-hmm. I, I can't remember the how many trans people there are in total, but 2% of let's say, what, a uh, 100,000 is still going to be a good handful of cases and everyone has social media nowadays. So it's also not surprising that all of those people would be public about their story. Having, you know, uh, do you know more than a hundred people who've regretted their trans, their transition? Because even a hundred people publicly regretting their transition would be well within the expected parameters and still a very, very low regret rate compared to other similar interventions. So uh, when I hear people say, you know, uh, I see a lot of um, female to male trans people regretting t- transition, usually they're talking about like the the f- like five prominent detransitioners that are on, you know, every podcast, uh, not like an actual, mm-hmm. I know personally, multiple detransitioners. Um, and when we're talking about detransition, Most of the reason is because of social factors, and a lot of those people then go on to retransition. That's actually my story. I transitioned at 13, I transitioned at 17, and then transitioned again at 22. Um, So, I, I, well, I respect that, you know, there's definitely cause for concern. You're not in their head. You can't know what their motivating factors are. Um, I I would, I, I appreciate that you have been wary about bringing this up to your friend because I think that could be. Uh, potentially not great for them to hear. Uh, but Naomi, I, do you want to jump in on this? Sorry, I'm, I'm ranting a little yeah, bit. Yeah, th- there's definitely definitely a couple points you brought up. I think that you did a really good job hitting on kind of the concern of detransition. The other thing that you first brought up was you're, you're really concerned with the idea of minors altering their bodies in, in, in any kind of way. And I think that it's important to start mm-hmm. with an extreme example just so that we can, we can kind of figure out where that line is. So there are some kids that develop cancer and we have treatments for pediatric cancer, including chemotherapy, which can cause a lot of significant changes in someone's body. I mean, if we're opposed to altering a minor's body in any way, how could we treat pediatric cancer? Are, are, are you okay with like the treatment of pediatric cancer, for example? Well, that is a good question. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, why would, is that? Um, definitely support, um, you know, because there is a, um, a physical issue in their body. And I definitely recognize that, you know, being trans is, I don't want to necessarily say issue, but something like dysphoria is an issue that somebody genuinely experiences that can be as real as cancer um, or any other illness. So yeah, that is a good point. Um, So if you got got kind of on that, go for it. I was just going to say, I just worry that, um, no, we may be, treating an issue that is not necessarily the predominant issue. And especially when they're a child. And I mean, I don't, for my own personal experience, I, I identify as bisexual. Um, and when I was a child, I experienced this in a lot of different ways. And um, I, I wished to be a boy. And now I know that that's not necessarily that people experience transness in a different way than I experienced my identity as a child, but I know that if I had um, maybe a different experience, I may have been transitioned as a child, and I am, I am not trans. Um, And I guess I just worry that somebody who was like me as a child, who very much was tomboyish, very much wanted to be a boy, um, was attracted to girls, may be transitioned wrongly. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, I, I hear you. I think that I think that so so far we've established that there are these at least extreme cases where when it comes to the health of a child, we can give them medication, even if it might cause, you know, permanent alteration in their body. And, and we use kind of pediatric cancers as a physical example. And then moving into the mental health realm, we can think about conditions like depression or anxiety or ADHD, which we regularly provide treatment for children. And I, I think that kind mm -hmm. of the, the trans healthcare is very analogous to this type of mental health treatment where it's been shown that ADHD meds, antidepressants, these can even have permanent effects on the brain if you take them for long enough. Um, but we still regularly give these as treatment to, to children because it's shown to drastically improve their well-being in society and to drastically improve their mental health. I, I also hear this kind of narrative quite a bit, the one that you brought up particularly about, you know, I worry if I was a kid today, I might have been trans. And I, I just think that, you know, if, if you were able to, on your own, realize that you, you know, you're, you're not a boy, you, you don't identify as a boy, you don't want to be a boy, um, and you had to go through years of gender therapy, uh, months of gender therapy before you could even go on puberty blockers. Don't you think the gender therapist would be able to help you explore that and figure out that you're just gender nonconforming, that you're, you're not actually a trans boy, for example? Actually, we have plenty of studies which show that the overwhelming majority of referrals to gender clinics are for just gender nonconforming kids who realize that they're not trans, they're just gender nonconforming, and they live happy lives as gender nonconforming people. Yeah, I think you're probably right. And um, a little bit of background, I am ex-Mormon and I live in Arizona, obviously. So I get fed a lot of anti-trans rhetoric a lot. And so I'm just kind of sitting in this space where I'm trying to figure out exactly what I think. And I, I've met a lot of trans people and I don't necessarily think that they're wrong or any sort of hateful things that I've heard people say, but I'm just trying to figure out where I sit on all of this and want to have a conversation with trans people in a very respectful way. So I really appreciate all the information. Yeah, yeah thank you so thank much. Thank you so much for calling, Emma. I mean, this, that's what, when Katie and I did the show, this is what we did the show for. Because I think there are, I would say the majority of Americans right now are probably in your shoes, Emma, where they are mm -hmm. probably know a handful of trans people, maybe one um, nowadays at least. And, uh, and and they probably are not sure what to think on a lot of these issues. And so having this place where you can come and ask these questions and hopefully not feel like we're attacking you too hard or anything, even when we're like, you know, no, calling out not. issues. Good, good. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for calling. We really appreciate it. And if you have any other thoughts, of please course. do call us again. We'd love to talk to you. Of yeah, course. Thank, thank you so you much for so calling. Much. Really I appreciate, appreciate those convos. Thanks. Bye, Emma. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to remind our audience really quick before we get on to the next call that we are going to do super chats at the end of the caller portion. Uh, any super chats, $5 or more, we will read live on air. We have not decided on officially what our brawl is. So, you know, get thinking chat, help us out here uh, uh, for voting on Team Arden versus Team Naomi. Uh, also be sure to check out, well, you know, uh, I would say Transatlantic is the best show on the line. There are other shows on the line. You've got the Sunday show with Matt and Jimmy. That's going to be this Sunday. Uh, Skep Talk on Monday and Hostility on Tuesday. Vice Rhino will be on with Matt on the Hangup next Wednesday. And then back here next Thursday will be Katie and Ben uh, at the same usual time. So be sure to check out all that stuff. Uh, but let's see, who do we got on the line? Um, okay, let's bring in Simon in Germany. Pronouns are he, him. Simon, you are on the Hello. line. What's going on? Welcome, welcome. Hey. Um... So yeah, I was trying to call in because um, I've been thinking about transitioning for a while now, um, but I'm starting to think that with the social climate being the way it is, it might not be worth it because I, um, I was like in this centrist political server on Discord for a bit. And I saw, like, in the course of, like, half a year, people going from, yeah, I don't have a problem with trans people, just, like, don't over-prescribe it or something, or, like, make sure that the diagnostic is, the diagnosis is well-made, turned into, like, actual people that wouldn't piss on your burning body to help you out if you're trans and 
like it was literally in like the over the course of like half a year and i'm starting to think that it might be too dangerous yeah this is a really interesting thing you're touching on simon i mean first of all i'm sorry to hear that you feel so uh stressed about the idea of coming out or transitioning um but we kind of touched on this earlier when, when it comes to people who like regret transition, most of the people who detransition and regret transition uh, seem to be due to what you're dealing with right now, fear of social pushback, you know, uh, not acceptance from their family and not acceptance from their uh, employer or their community leaders. Like if you are in a, like a religious community, things like that. Um, so it's definitely a, a prevalent fear that I think affects all trans people to some degree. Um, that said, uh, I will say that, uh, I, I don't know what the community that you live in IRL is like, but I, I the, uh, evidence for the efficacy of transition doesn't change based on, uh, uh, you know, living in Germany versus living in the U S I think mm. you would probably benefit from transition just like any other trans person if you were to go through with it. And from my own experience as someone who did go who did detransition, um, I will say the thing that I learned was that what I was afraid of most was that I think I hated myself and my own transness more than anybody else did. And that um, my transness was not something I could escape. It, it was a part of me, whether I liked it or not. And I think maybe an important tool and goal for you um, is going to be really evaluating where your fear is. Because if you're in these communities that are talking so horribly about trans people, it sounds like your fear is that maybe you, you're you going to be looked at that way by your peers. And Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, but that doesn't make you not trans just because those people suck. You know, Maybe it should be the case that you are trying to find a community that's going to respect you and treat you with dignity for being who you are. Because... Just, I mean, you can bury it in the closet. People have for a long time. But I will say, I think your quality of life is going to improve dramatically if you consider transition. But I also don't want you to feel pressured into that because it is very a personal decision. You need to evaluate these things deeply. Talk to everyone involved. Um, you know, talk to other yeah, people. I, uh, I, I've, I've actually... Um... I I I was pretty sure that I wanted to be a woman like ever since I was like four years old, and even my um, my psychiatrist told me that I'm like one of the clearest cases of gender dysphoria, and the only way that I could have been more clear would have been if I showed up in drag, basically. <laughs> um, and I'm just. Yeah, I'm I, I'm just I'm just afraid that if I go through this through with this, that my life will be even worse, or that um, maybe yeah, I also have like a bunch of people, like even friends and such, telling me who I told that I'm trans, that like oh yeah, no, it's just your past trauma, and you should just get therapy for your depression and then it will go away but i and i'm i'm afraid that because i i know that transitioning is a cure all i know that it's like i i also know that i have some other problems that are not related to gender dysphoria but i do believe that a lot of like my trouble also comes from the gender dysphoria like a lot of my depression and such i'm just yeah, I'm just I'm just afraid that what if it doesn't solve it and what if everyone's right and what if I am just a delusional fucking tranny that doesn't <laughs> Yeah, that just wants an X wound in their crotch and will be the next new fucking um sure. so lobotomy is, you know. <laughs> I will say uh uh the thing I've said a lot on the show is that the one universal trans experience is feeling like you are not trans enough, like you are actually the the one true fraud. Um, so I, I think that is probably, if anything, an indication that you are probably 
dealing with gender dysphoria. And, and again, I am not going to pressure you into wanting to do transition, but I will say the evidence is pretty clear yeah. on what's going to improve your quality of life. I'm not going to tell you it's going to fix all your problems or cure your depression, right? Uh, mm-hmm. That you may have some severe clinical depression that needs separate treatment. But I think it's worth, if you said your psychiatrist is, thinks you're a very clear case and that it, you know the only thing that would have been more clear is if you showed up in drag, it probably would have been useful for you to explore transition, right? Because transition does not have to be a all or nothing, flip a switch, and now I'm on the path kind of thing. Like the, something Katie and I have talked a lot about. It's okay to start with just getting like laser hair removal, if that's something you can afford and have access to. Like maybe mm-hmm. you're like, well, I think I'm trans, but I'm really nervous about doing transition, but I know for sure I hate fucking facial hair. Awesome. Go get fucking laser hair removal and see how that makes you feel. If that makes you feel validated, then consider what other steps might be helpful and seeing how that makes you feel and kind of letting those steps compound themselves. Uh, yeah, Naomi, also, I see you're back in. Absolutely, you yeah. Weigh in on this? Definitely. I, I think that Arden brings a great point that transitioning is for you. It's about exploring who you want to be, what you want to do, what's going to make you most happy and healthy. And if that's what your doctors are saying, I, I think that seems pretty clear. I mean, even your friends telling you to, to go talk to a doctor, this is what the doctor's telling you, right? Um, I, I also think that I, I see this kind of tendency often that when, when people are in kind of this critical thinking, considering, am I trans? Like, do I want to transition? What do I want to do phase? They get really entrenched in like the online rhetoric and the online discourse, which is extremely, extremely um, just blatantly transphobic right now, especially with the, the rising attacks against trans people. When, when mm-hmm. you see all these attacks against trans people online, when you see discourse shifting in political service, for example, it can be really, really hard to remember the moments of trans joy where people, you know, they just present themselves a certain way and, and they have this amazing feeling where, wow, I, I, I actually enjoy the way I look for the first time in my life. Um, you know, all, all of these moments are, are often so forgotten when you're really entrenched in these kind of like heavy dis- heavy discourse spaces. And IRL, with respect to trans people, most people tend to be a lot more just live and let live. And that is so, yeah. so forgotten from the online discourse where, I mean, when I go out, I don't know, out and about in society, everybody just perceives and treats me as a woman. And there is, I, I don't face transphobia in my daily life. But if I go online, that's going to be the only place where I am uh, subject to immense amounts of transphobia. So de- definitely focus on, you know, what can I do in the real world just to be happier and healthier as the person that I want to be? I think that would be kind of my my biggest advice there. Yeah, yeah, I've also been starting to do that sort of stuff recently and preparing a little. I just recently made a um, an appointment for um, cryo conversation, uh, um, cryo conservation of uh, sperm, in case I do want to go through with it. It's just um, anytime I pick up my my phone to call my therapist that I I'm thinking that I want to go through with it now and that my break is over I am just like I feel like fear and I don't want to do it anymore and uh, yeah. it's just yeah I I will say again like one of the big things that tipped me over into the like retransition point of my life was kind of what you're talking about right now was I I was like, I have been for over a decade now, deeply, deeply wrestling with the fact that I am trans and I don't want to be. And again, overwhelmingly, the evidence shows that transition is highly efficacious in alleviating your dysphoria and improving your quality of life. And I really want to echo what Naomi said. Uh, even early in transition when I didn't pass, I, I, when you were out at the grocery store, I've told this story before. I used to go to the grocery store and not get out of my car because I was so afraid of how people would treat me. And when I finally did get out of my car and go in the grocery store, you know what I learned? Nobody gives a fuck. Everyone is so <laughs> concerned with their own lives. It's like you, do, you will have bigotry, right? You will probably experience mm-hmm. some transphobia here or there. And that is scary. I don't want to like lead you on to thinking it's going to be all roses and, and rainbows. It There are hard times when you're an open trans person, but most of the time people don't care. And they're, they're way too wrapped up in their own life. Even the bigots that I interact with, 
when you interact with them in real life, they're like, oh, but you're the exception because you don't fit my prejudices. And I'm like, it's because nobody fits your prejudice. You just <laughs> don't even think about it. Yeah. Um, speaking, of, speaking of that, can I ask one last question about like that? Because my my friend, I've been like friends with him for 10 years now, and he's been drifting further right and right. And he's I would I would clear, I would say he's like an extremist at this point and he is like pro re education of like trans people and shit and I don't really know what to do with him because like we're good friends when it comes to non political issues but if I bring up I'm trans he's just like telling me I'm not or that trans people are just weirdos and I'm not one of those and that he knows me. And one thing that like really like hurt me was when he asked, so who am I talking to now? Am I talking to Simon or am I, to or am I talking to this made up persona you're telling me about? And that kind of um, was really tough on me because I didn't know how to answer that because I don't know when the mask that I wear on a day to day basis becomes the real me and what yeah yeah those I mean, scenarios can just be really tricky to navigate I, ultimately you know there are going to be people that you know that they're not going to have the reaction that that you wanted and, and it can it can turn very sour very quickly what's really important is expressing what your boundaries are like you know telling them hey I, i'm not going to tolerate if you're going to cross this boundary of mine whatever those boundaries may be. And you know, if you're the kind of person that feels like you would want him to kind of like open up to you and have an open dialogue, then you can absolutely tell him, hey, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to talk to you about this. I'd love to explain who I am. Um, let me know, you, you come to me and we can have that convo if you want, but I just need respect and for you to acknowledge that these are my boundaries and that if you want to maintain this relationship with me, then these are the boundaries that I have to establish for my own mental health, my own safety. Okay. Yeah. I think that's great advice. Yeah. I, I, thank you very I, much, I, guys. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you so sorry. Much. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I was just, just going to wish you guys a nice day. I don't want to hold up the line. You guys are very busy. <laughs> thank you so much. I really well, appreciate thank you so much. And best of luck. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. 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 I, I definitely right. relate to that experience as well. I was ultimately my biggest gatekeeper in transition more than anybody else. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh my God. It's so true. I think everyone does that too. That's why I've always said that. We're all definitely the, the universal experience is doubting. Uh, so there's a caller on the line who's a little extra spicy, potentially, I'm told. Uh, they've only been online for a few minutes. So sorry to the people who've been waiting forever, but we prioritize the spice on this show. So we're going to bring Christopher <laughs> in California. Pronouns are he, him. Christopher, you're on the line. What's going on? Hi. Good, hey. good, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Nice to have you on. All right. Yeah, it's great to be here. Long time listener of the line. First time caller. Um, so uh, I could just uh, say my topic or how do you want to start? However you want to do it. You go ahead and state your topic for the audience, and then we'll get into it. All right. Well, I'm I'm mostly on the fence here. So I, my point isn't that. Oh, I think we. Oh, they just cut out. Yep. You might have muted your. Sometimes I mute with my face. So maybe check to see that you didn't mute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Um. Let's return this caller to the queue really quickly. Uh, oh, I think I might just heard a little something. There. Yeah, nope. so go ahead and okay. get that issue sorted. I do want to talk to you, though, Christopher, because that does sound like an interesting topic. So if you're listening, um, <clears throat> stay on the line. We'll get to you. Um, so let's see. What else we got? We've got uh, a caller, Zach, in, color, or in Denver, Colorado. Pronouns are he, him. Thinks that our maybe our poll question... Uh, is not so great. Is that my understanding? Yes. So, I, I mean, kind of. So, I, I'm also kind of a fence sitter person, and I don't know a lot about trans issues. I've had maybe like one or two trans friends in high school, and that's about mm -hmm. as far as my experience goes. Um, but from my understanding, um, and from the people that I've talked to, um, 
correct me if I'm wrong, but trans people tend to have um, issues with depression and anxiety. And a lot of that is caused like externally by other people, but it's still a big problem for them. Um, like my old friend used to take Xanax for it and a bunch of um, different medications and things that, that help them. Um, so my question is, the, the question of is uh, gender dysphoria a mental illness, it sounds like technically no, but later on, yes. So my question to you guys is, do you think it's a mental health issue at all? Or is it something completely different and I'm like wording things wrong? Or how should I? I think I know exactly what you're getting at. Yeah. How should I word that? what, What you're getting at is whether or not gender dysphoria is best explained by the medicalized model of disability or by the socialized model of disability, where the medicalized model tries to say that you know what a, what a mental illness is, or, or what a, what a disease is, is something that's in, located inside the body. There's something wrong with you, and, and we need to use the medical system to fix that. Meanwhile, the social disability model says that there's something wrong with society that is creating these problems in these people. And so it's not that there's something wrong with like the trans person's brain or the trans person's body, but rather that society isn't allowing this person to express themselves how they want. That they're being mistreated for being trans. That they're they're being forced to play along with a system of gender that just doesn't really fit right with them. And I, I think that these models can both be true to varying extents when we're talking about certain conditions. Uh, one of the best examples for this is anorexia, where we've seen exploding rates of anorexia, especially in response to how media portrayal of especially women's bodies has, has been changing over the past uh, like five decades or so. Uh, yet there is this kind of medicalized component of, of there are people that are, that are suffering from these conditions that we can help with treatment with medicine. And so I think that what you're getting at is that a lot of the, the problems we associate with gender dysphoria are best explained by this, this social disability model, where if we can make society more accepting of gender nonconformity, of trans people, of having different sexually amorphic body types, uh, be they transsexual or intersex or cissexual, then a society that's more welcoming of all these people would help alleviate much of the co- root causes of gender dysphoria. So I... I agree with that, but I also disagree on a few things because like, for example, like I have ADHD, which is like technically like a cognitive thing, right? But it Mm -hmm. affects my daily life and the decisions that I make. And like, I have to extra focus on eating food and I have difficulty with like certain types of things. I'm super picky, that kind of thing. Um, But technically that's caused by like you could say chemical imbalance of the brain or whatever, like there's something physical going on. So my question to, I guess, like the host would be, is there anything physical at all going on with gender dysphoria or is it only a, a societal thing? Because I don't necessarily think that it's just a societal thing because otherwise there would be, um, I don't know how to explain this. Yeah. It, it would be similar to like being like a football player or a basketball player where like people hate you or people like you. And it's not necessarily like um, at all related to how you're born or, or how you think or the way you act in your daily life. And I think like gender dysphoria is, is kind of linked to that kind of like ADHD is, if that makes so, sense. Yeah. If what you're asking is like, is there some like physiological or like brain? So uh, the way, if this helps, <clears throat> the way I've described gender, this is not, Uh, also like something you see in like papers this is like my interpretation of reading all the evidence and how i've decided to describe it i think so i did not coin this though somebody else said it before me was it's like a durable psychological state what that means is like everything like handedness or sexuality or personality these are like these psychological states that obviously exist in the brain in some capacity but we can't pinpoint exactly where there's not like a a a neuron you can tweak that'll like flick the switch right so obviously gender identity uh, as as it's uh, thought of in in all the research exists in the brain physically in some capacity but i think the issue is that the distress people experience and i think this is where naomi was kind of saying that it's almost like correct me if i'm wrong naomi i don't want to put words in your mouth uh where it seems like uh there you can have both at the same time right because like you, you have the reality part the medicalized part that's physically in your brain and then but the issue the anxiety the depression all of that is caused by society which won't just let you live your life 
uh, in Got spite it. of this this difference in your body. So is that okay? Does that help kind of bridge the gap? Yeah, there? yeah, I agree with that. Okay, that's yeah. Maybe do you disagree with like, like, yeah. how I phrased that at all? No, no, that's that's exactly what I was trying to get at. Where when I was explaining, like in the anorexia example, you know, we had societal conditions which amplified anorexia in people, but there is kind of that still that physiological or medicalized component which we can address, and so. When we're talking about like trans people, we have a lot of studies that show that the brains of trans people more closely resemble the brains of people that identify with that gender. So the brains of trans women more closely resemble the brains of cis women and the brains of trans men clo more closely resemble the brains of cis men. Um, and so this shows that there is this kind of physiological component going on, yet at the same time, a lot of the societal conditions we create are really amplifying some of the distresses of this kind of like disconnect between the brain and body potentially. And so what we do about that is, is we kind of take this two-pronged approach where we, where we try to treat people physiologically to alleviate symptoms of distress and dysphoria. At the same time, we try to transform society and culture to be more accepting and welcoming of people with uh, diverse gender expression, with diverse sexual expression, um, you know. And this is just going to improve everything from, from multiple angles. Both improving society and improving medicine is going to help trans people. It's going to help intersex people, help non-binary people, all of the above. Got it. Okay. That that clarifies a lot for me because like the poll question, I was like, are we saying that trans that, that gender dysphoria is not a mental health issue? Is that what we're trying to say here? Because like yes. I was like confused as to how that could be if like suicide rates and depression rates are as high as they are, if that makes sure. sense. And like the thing Absolutely. I always think about is like this is gonna sound bigoted, but I promise it's not. There's an episode of South Park from like 1998 oh, no. called like Big Gay Al, and like um, he's taking like uh, uh, a couple of the kids on a boat ride and showing them how there's been like gay animals throughout history and there's been gay people throughout history and it's like I think about the same thing about trans people and people of all different types is like people have existed for however long there's got to been at least some trans guy back in like the 500s you know. It's like, I, I don't necessarily think that um, saying, you can both say that it's normal and that it causes, or not causes, but has mm -hmm. mental health things tied to it at the same time without being like a Republican. And, and that's sure. all I'm trying to say, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And that's kind of what the point of the poll was to spur on that exact con kind of conversation of acknowledging that, you know, uh, uh, gender dysphoria is clearly a, a psychological experience. I mean, it, it's a, an experience that a conscious mind would go through, so it has to be in the brain, but that it's caused by social factors. But yeah, I'm, I'm gl glad this was able to help. This is a good conversation. So thank you so much, Zach, for calling in. Yep, thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. If everyone's good, we've got four more callers on the line. I think we can get them all. We probably can cap it there. Um, uh, oh, I see. It's already been done. Look at that. Our, our amazing producer is already <laughs> ahead of me. Uh, so uh, I do want to get to uh, line 13. That looks like a really interesting call. So I don't hope they don't hang out. But caller number four has been on the line for an hour uh, and 10 minutes. So let's bring her in. We've got Taryn in Arizona. Hopefully I'm saying your name right. She, pronouns are she, her. Taryn, you're on the line. What's going on? You pronounced my name perfectly. So, but, um, so I oh. recently came out about, oh, I came out about a year and a half ago and wasn't exactly the smoothest of coming out, it was more like ripping the bandaid off. But, um, sure. I, I'm at the point now of transitioning where I've started to think about what I want my name to be once I do transition fully. Um, mm -hmm. but it feels super weird trying to think of a name for myself. Is, is it more common for trans people to to make the, uh, to create their own names or is it more common for them to go back to their parents and say hey i now that i no longer identify as this gender you gave me a name for uh can you rename me like what is more common uh i think it's hard to determine what's m most common i would assume that um uh, uh that choosing your name is the most common um but like so my mom didn't rename me, but I picked Arden because my mom had read it in a book recently. And while I was deciding on names, she was like, hey, how do you feel about Arden? And I was like, oh, it's perfect. I want it. <laughs> but I will say <laughs> it took a little while for me to feel like 
Arden was me. Now, granted, I've been going, actually, I think as of this year, I will officially have been Arden longer than I was my dead name. So that's really cool. Um, but well, uh, congratulations. Thank you. But yeah, uh, it does take time for it to feel normal. And I think that's just a matter of brains. Like, kind of like uh, the old saying when I was in school, they would say like uh, neurons that fire together, wire together, you know, it's not necessarily super scientific, but it's this notion that like, when you hear your name said over and over and over again, it's going to take a while to deprogram yourself, like neurologically speaking, from associating you, the individual with that, like, and to, to reform those connections, but it will happen in due time. So, you know, and if you don't like the first name you pick, cool thing is, you can do whatever the fuck you want. Change it again. <laughs> Change it five times. Who cares? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't have I any just... hard data on this. But um, in, in my experience, most of the trans people that I know did choose their own name. Although if you have supporting parents and, and you want to ask them for input or help on naming yourself, uh, that's awesome. Absolutely go for it. And um, I yeah, have, absolutely I have power to you. I have a supportive <laughs> aunt that's been helping me through this. So I might actually ask her because my mom passed right. away a couple of years ago. So I can't really go to her. My dad's kind of socially awkward. So it feel, it's kind of odd talking to him. So it's, I mean, he's fully accepting and he's aware, but it's just kind of, it's just kind of an awkward conversation all the way. But I, I appreciate the help. Yeah, of Absolutely. course. And if you, you do so choose your name, if you do choose your name, you get to make the joke that other people, oh, nice name. Did your mom pick it out for you? <laughs> Somebody's <laughs> literally done that to me and I had to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Cool. Thank you so but, much, Taryn, for calling. I, I, Sorry to have you wait on the line for such a quick call. No, I just want to say something real quick to Simon, if he's still listening. Uh, I started laser hair removal yesterday. And the euphoria I got just starting was super exciting. If this oh. is something you want to do and you know for a fact, do it. Because I was happy when I walked out of that room. Good. That's so awesome. That's so here. awesome. Thank you so much for calling, Taryn. Thanks. Yeah, real quick. Uh, Jimmy, go fuck yourself. Arden, I love you. Uh, to the other lady whose name I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm looking. Oh, it's Naomi. not on the screen. But uh, Naomi, thank you. You were both a big help. Thanks so much, Taryn. Have a good one. Thank you. Awesome. Go fuck yourself. I'm, wait, you, you were here recently, Naomi, right? So you probably know what go fuck yourself Jimmy is. Uh, <laughs> I am in on the joke. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. It's funnier if All we right. stop explaining it. I know, I know. I was just like, I'm assuming nobody knows. So, uh, okay, let's see. We've got uh, Grayson in Michigan. Pronouns are he, him. Grayson, you're on the line. What's up? Uh, hello. Hi. Oh. Welcome, welcome. Uh, hi, Th this is really cool. I have I started watching the show like a, cu a couple, uh, just the line in general, like a couple of months ago. And oh, awesome. <laughs> all all of y'all have been super like cool to watch. Thank you so much. That means a lot. So what do you want to talk about today? Uh, so basically I came out, so I've been out to my family for, for three, almost four years now. And I started like medically transitioning around six months ago. Mm. And my family is just in like very deep denial about the fact I'm trans at all. Like my mom straight up told me recently that this isn't me, and if I could, I would leave, I would make you stop taking tea today. Like mm. it, <laughs> and I just I was hoping you would have some advice on like how to not even persuade them, just like deal with it, I guess. Because like I literally, like I was telling the call screener, I literally can't be home for longer than like two or three days without my mental health taking like a noticeable tank. <laughs> Yeah, that's relatable as fuck. Um, uh, so, I, I mean, I, I think kind of touching on a call that we had earlier, it's important to definitely enforce strong boundaries. Like, I, I always get nervous about issuing this advice because I know it's sometimes harder for other people than it was for me. But like, so for example, my dad, uh, he's a lot better now than he used to be, but it was bad for a long time. And we are still at a point where we don't talk. Um, he, I will get a text occasionally about my little brother, and that is about the extent of our conversation, <laughs> like two or three a year. And that's okay with me. But I think it's important to maybe kind of lay down some lines like that. Like, listen, mom, like, I love you, and I want you to be a part of my life and, and to maybe even be a part of this journey with me. But 
that said, I don't want to be talked to like that. I don't like how it feels when I go home and the way you speak to me makes my mental health tank. So with all due respect, like, unless you're willing to respect me and who I am, I, I don't know if we can have that active of a, of a relationship with each other. Um, but th that said, I know it's sometimes harder for other people to make that cut with their family than it was for me. Um, my dad was such a dick that I was just like, nope, bye, clip. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know, Naomi, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I definitely, definitely agree with the advice of, of setting boundaries. And obviously things can get more complicated depending on your living situation. Like if you live with the parents, uh, it can be a lot harder to set those boundaries when, you know, at, at the end of the day, all you want is their basic respect and acceptance and, and just, just for them to, to refer to you in a way that's going to make you able to be mentally sane and healthy while you're interacting with them. Uh, and I know you mentioned maybe trying to persuade them. Uh, persuading them is a, a lot harder than just expressing boundaries about acceptance. But if you are going to persuade them, then what's really important about trying to persuade them is they need to come to you. So you need to tell them, like, for example, yeah, I, I know you might have some concerns about me being trans, about me seeing these doctors. Um, I would love to talk to you about that sometime. Just let me know if you want to have a conversation. Hit me up. Uh, if you want to learn, I am more than happy to talk about this and we can work through it together. But, you know, if you're kind of coming to them with it, it kind of can make them feel defensive and, it, and it's hard for them to really open up and, and to really try to understand your perspective. But if, if they set a time where they're coming to you, they're at least making a, a conscious concession already that they're going to hear you out and they're going to listen to you. And that would be the, the kind of environment where it would be possible to try to, to change their mind on these aspects. Okay, th thank you. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully that was helpful. I realize it's a, sorry, I realize you've also waited for an hour to get like kind of short answers, but uh, is there anything else you wanted to add there? Uh, I guess to, if the previous caller is still listening about the name thing, uh, I picked my name because of a song. So like oh, yeah. originally I went by Gray because of Seal's Kiss from a Rose. And like, and then it changed. I changed it to Grayson later. So like, don't be afraid to experiment with names, and also don't be afraid to have a dumb reason for picking a name. Like yeah. I know a person who went. I know a person who literally just went through a, a list of baby names and was like, "Oh, I like the sound of that one," and just stuck with it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it does not have to be deep at all. <laughs> just you like the sound is totally valid. Well, thank you so much for calling, Grayson. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I wish you the best of luck. If you have any like luck talking to them or like having conversations with them, you want to let our audience know, please do call back. We'd love to hear it. Okay. We'll will do. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thanks. Have a lovely day. All right. We've got two callers left on the line. We're gonna get them both. Uh, I do want to thank our screeners, uh, Ilya and Dragon, today for helping out screening calls. We really appreciate you guys. It's a huge help because we've got to have really awesome call lists today. I mean, like, literally, like, some of the top tier calls we've had in a long time. So thank you guys so much. All right. But first, we're going to bring in uh, Eli in Colorado. Pronouns are he and they. Uh, Eli, you're on the line. What's going on? Hi. Yeah. Um, so recently, um, my little sister has joined this, uh, small theater troupe. She's like 10. Um, but they only do Harry Potter plays and I <laughs> really want to help support my sister in doing something she really enjoys, but I don't know how to do that with what it is. Yeah. You know, like. Because I, morally, I don't feel like I, I can. So, um, sorry, is it, so is this like a very Potter musical? Like what, or is it like a home, like a, a written, like, it, it's like kind a, of musical? Like, it, it's like an abridged, like kids just, we want them to learn how to do theater and we okay. chose a Harry Potter backdrop, I guess. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So actually, I used to be super into theater. I originally went to school on a scholarship for musical theater. Oh, I was one of those kids. <laughs> the worst. I know. It's so annoying. <laughs> but I used to also work at a, a program that did basically that. And I don't know. Um, 
this is a little bit difficult because I, I think maybe I diverge a little bit from the online persona on this. I, I think it's good, like k- kind of like my position on veganism. I think it's morally virtuous. It's good to uh, uh, stop eating meat and to to not contribute to these systems that can be harmful. But I don't necessarily know how terrible it is to have a couple of, it sounds like very young kids are doing this play. Um, I definitely think Relative, you can draw yeah. pretty straight lines to supporting JK Rowling and how that causes harm. But that being said, I think Harry Potter has kind of evolved a little bit beyond that. And I, I don't know, I, all this to say, I don't want you to feel like if you're supporting your little sister doing a play with a bunch of other kids to learn how to do theater, I don't think you're necessarily contributing to like the trans genocide by doing that. Um, but I don't know, maybe Naomi had totally disagrees with me. I'd love to hear what you think. Yeah, this is a bit of an interesting one. I, I think that one of the other bigger components when people were talking about like the Hogwarts legacy discourse was the, the royalty checks, which JK Rowling was going to be receiving from sales on Hogwarts legacy. I I don't think that J.K. Rowling's going to be getting any kind of royalty checks from this this play involving children. So that kind of financial component is out the window, which I, I think in that case, you know, if it's just kids having fun, then I don't really see an issue. Definitely, definitely support your kids. And um, yeah, just, just try to make it a good time and, and avoid any kind of like negative elements if they were to arise, which it, it, it seems the only kind of negative element we identified is that like there's this loose association with Harry Potter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it may be worth. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Eli. I want you to get a chance. Before I... Good. I, it's yeah. It's just. Um, I, I wanted to say thank you because I had brought this up a few times in a few different places, and I was getting a lot of mixed stuff. So hearing someone who like is such a big name in the space talk about it is feels a lot more definitive than just some random name online, you know. Sure. I'll say it may be worth, you know, talking to, I don't know what the production crew or company is like. Most, in my experience, most production crews are very, very left-leaning. Most theater kids are very, very progressive and leftist on these issues. So maybe worth floating like themselves. <laughs> yeah, in the pamphlet, you know, usually you get like a little playbill when you go to see a play or musical. Maybe we can have a little foreword that's like, you know, a a portion of the proceeds will be donated to a local LGBT center or something, or, or or some sort of way to acknowledge the the potential issue. But it doesn't have to be that serious. I think I, yeah. I think you can be critical as an individual, and maybe you can be critical as a you know production company. Uh, but I don't know if this is really as serious as like Hogwarts Legacy or or something similar yeah. to that. Right. And then um, if if I could also say something to one of the earlier calls about the like surgery and whatnot, um, if there's time for it, I don't want to take up too much. Uh, no, go ahead. We're um, right so I, I used to struggle with uh, tonsil stones a whole lot and it got pretty bad to the point where I didn't want to go anywhere because they I don't know if you've heard of them before, but they smell really bad, but Mm -hmm. I couldn't find a doctor that would take out my tonsils because, um, it wasn't life threatening. And it, I was very depressed just because I had these things in the back of my throat that were impacting my day to day life in a way that most other people around me didn't necessarily notice. And mm. when I did finally find a doctor that was willing to take them out and I got them out, it was one of the best days of my life. Mm. So I don't think wanting something in your body that is causing you mental anguish gone or something added is necessarily mental illness. There could be some mental illness that is like around some of that but just the desire for it gone i don't know that anybody would have called what i was going through mental illness yeah agreed definitely there there is a lot of complexities which is what 
I, I think that was the goal of the whole poll that has clearly stirred on a lot of feelings and callers <laughs> today was, was to try to kind of shine a light on that. But I think I might do a like pinned comment under the poll, maybe get some clarification in there because it seems like a lot of people are having a very similar response today. So thank you so much for your call, Eli. We appreciate yep. it. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, have a good one. Yep, you too. Bye. Thank you. All right. We got one caller left on the line today, and then we're going to go over to our super chats. So, you know, if you think Naomi and I have just totally got it fucking wrong on, on some of these calls today, please <laughs> let us know. Uh, I'm sure people will have some differing opinions on, on the Harry Potter play discourse. It's going to be the new new discourse hitting Twitter. Uh, <laughs> but uh, until then, we're going to bring in Michael in Virginia. Pronouns are he, him. Michael, you're on the line. What's up? Hello, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear yes. you. Welcome, welcome. Oh, holy crap, my speaker's actually working. Um, Great. What, what do you want yeah, to talk so, about today? I'm probably already read there. I, I'm a father of four, and and um, observing my, and my youngest is about two two years, nine months, but, and I'm, I observe out in the, on the east or there, like, um, like when you see on social media, when you see on regular things, and I see it in my, the oldest is 13 and the, and the middle one is 12 and, and in their other school and stuff like that, they, there are kids who are transgender and, and, um, and all that. And, and one of the, and one of the things is that I have a, I, I've, I have a kind of a hard time with kind of wrapping my whole, my head up, my kind of wrapping my head up around the whole thing. Because I mean, needless to say, I mean, you, you, you look pretty, you look pretty young. So you're probably younger than me, but um, I grew up in a different time. You know, my childhood was in a different time. And, it, and then from 1989 to, to around the early 2000s is kind of where I was, is kind of where the, my base foundation kind of grew up in the nineties was the last day. De- I usually say that the nineties was the last decade where things were done the old way. Mm-hmm. So uh, what is the question you're asking? I guess, I, I mean, I appreciate the, the backstory. It seems like you're leading up to the question. Oh, you still there, Michael? Uh Oh, all right, we're going to give Michael a second no. to reconnect. <laughs> Man, oh, I, I feel like we were building up to the, I guess maybe he cut off, not because he wasn't, maybe he did the mic clipped or something. Um, oh, that's so unfortunate. Man, what, no a, question? Oh. <laughs> what an anticlimactic way to end the caller portion of the show. All I right, guess kind of well, expanding on on the backstory just a little bit. You know, some sometimes things can be confusing and, you don't even have to understand confusing things just to know that it's a real phenomenon that happens in the world and that there are things we can do to help people. Like, you know, I, I don't pretend to know how like uh, nuclear energy works, but I know that it can produce a lot of energy it can be a very good thing for, you know, revolutionizing our, our energy grid, for example. Um, mm-hmm. And if a trans person's existence or identity is kind of confusing, but you know that, you know, they can see doctors and, and, and we can be kind in how we treat them and accept them and, and that improves their life, improves their well-being, then I'm perfectly okay if people not necessarily understanding the complexities of human experience, so long as they're supportive and trying to help people. Absolutely. I, I've always advocated for that, that like, um, there was a certain point in my transition where I kind of decided that whether or not uh, people could identify that I was trans, I, I didn't really care because it, there's nothing wrong with being trans and uh, they don't, I don't need them to understand me or to accept my transness for them to treat me with dignity when I am operating in the public space like everyone else. As long as I'm given basic respect uh, as I'm going about my life, you know, applying for housing and jobs and things, that is what I'm advocating for for trans people and advocating for evidence-based care too. So I think there was something in the call notes about maybe being concerned about treatment for adolescents as well. I would urge you to watch the earlier parts of the show because we did kind of touch on this already, but definitely I, what we and what almost every trans person I've ever had on the show and talked to has ever advocated for is evidence-based care for trans minors. Uh, 
I want them to have the best possible outcomes that they can have according to the medical science. So, uh, you know, there's no, no concerns for rushing kids or giving them treatment that's experimental or that's not going to work. We want them to take the medicine that's going to make them the happiest, healthiest, most productive kids that they can be. Um, but yeah, well, thank you for calling. I hope you're still listening, caller, even though we didn't get to talk to you directly. I'm sorry that there's something, I think it could have been a web connection thing that happens sometimes. But with that said, we are going to move on to the super chat portion of the show. Naomi, thanks so much for being doing the calls with me on trans. I mean, you obviously get to stay around and do this part too, but how, how do you Ooh. feel? How are your calls? <laughs> Yeah, I thought, I thought those are great. Really, really always happy to dive into the topics and excited to see what we get in Super Chats. Let's see how many people are going to trash me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure no one, none. All right, so I'll start this one off and then we can go like back and forth. Uh, we've got $5 from RPG Debunks from one techie to another. This time I got to support hashtag Team Naomi. Four-way handshake, anyone? I promise my hat is white. Hashtag Callie for the win. Uh, hashtag go tie shoelaces Jimmy. I feel like there's maybe some uh, Naomi inside jokes that I'm not privy to. Callie for the win. What is that? Uh, that would be Kali Linux. It's a it's an operating system. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. I'm not not techy enough, I guess. <laughs> uh, do you want have this one? ten dollars from Alyssa Nguyen. Uh GC people are trying to say the recent leak slash stolen medical data isn't a privacy violation. When I was in the hospital earlier this month, my breakfast order was considered private health information. Oh, are we talking about like the, the Jesse Single leaks? Yeah, that was yeah. an extreme HIPAA violation. It it is it's gotta go down in history as the biggest face on pavement moment ever. <laughs> ever in gender critical history. It is yeah. If you guys don't know, um Jesse Single got a hold of a well, I don't. I want to be careful about promoting this too much because it doesn't need more attention than it's already gotten. But maybe it does need attention because it was so terrible. Um, some health providers at a gender identity clinic kept a list of trans people who they thought were potentially suspicious, like they weren't trans enough to be there. And somehow they got in connection with Jesse Single and gave him the list. And they tried to expose it as this big, haha, we've exposed the trans lobby thing. But all they've done is shown that there are bigots in the healthcare system in gender identity clinics like advocating for us so yeah uh, it was a HIPAA violation and just revealed how strong biases can still be in trans healthcare providers really thank you so much Alyssa for your support another five from Alyssa people with body integrity dysphoria want amputations that's even less understood than gender dysphoria and you can't assume they're connected yeah, you definitely can't assume they're connected. Um, that said, I don't know what the evidence is on body integrity dysphoria in terms of like treatment outcomes for giving them the amputations they're asking for. Um, but I mean, I actually, know, it, I, I, well, I actually know oh, a little bit there? on this one. It seems that oh, yeah. uh, with the limited evidence we have, the current medical guideline is to recommend sensory re-education therapy, which is the same kind of therapy we offer for stroke patients who lose connection to like feelings in their arms. And, and this is shown to be the most effective treatment we have for people that have this body identity integrity disorder. So different medical yeah. conditions have different treatments and we're just trying to help people. That's awesome. That's so interesting. I, I didn't know that. And now I have that in my back pocket when I could, I've heard this brought up like maybe three or four times in all of these discussions. So now it's nice to, to have that in the, in the wing. Oh, and we need a contest still uh, between Team Art and Team, I think <laughs> Team Naomi has a, has a vote. Um, yeah, where's my uh, point? Yeah, come on, Jimmy. You're this is why everyone thinks I'm the better producer. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so I think maybe the easiest thing to do would be to have one of us tweet out something because while well, I love Naomi, I would love to have her back on anytime. Um, uh, we usually are, our things are like next time we're on together, I will eat a as many. Uh, sour warheads as I can handle. I don't want to do that to you. So, uh, I'm down for a game like that if you want. Okay, all right, we can do that. Set so something like that up for next time you're on. Um, what what's what are some foods that you absolutely like could do in a challenge, but are probably gross to you? Ooh, um, I'm vegetarian, so I'm not going to violate that. But 
Okay. Uh, oh gosh. Thing, things that are like really vinegary bother me so much. Ooh. See, now I'm tempted to say pickle juice, but I we've gone over this last time. I kind of like pickle juice, so <laughs> I wouldn't be bothered too much. Um, <laughs> oh, somebody says kimchi. Oh, and that was in your chat too. I pulled up your chat so I could see what people over on the Twitch were saying. <laughs> oh, these um, people are trying to hurt me. <laughs> uh, salt and vinegar chips. See, but that's delicious. I could eat salt and vinegar chips yeah. just for fun. Uh, no, <laughs> you're so against it. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to torture you. Um, hmm, let's see. I know with uh, Josie Caballero, who's going to be on, of course, again soon. We did a vegan cheese challenge. We're going to have to guzzle some some vegan cheese. Um, how do you That's feel about too bad. <laughs> Do you want to do the cheese challenge? I'll put myself up for the cheese challenge twice. I, I won oh, the I last can do one, vegan so. cheese. Easy. Okay. <laughs> it's it's for. Oh, what? It's four ounces of vegan cheese sauce, and that stuff is nonsense. But Ooh, that's a lot. That's a lot. But okay, okay. It smells like feet. Oh, there you go. There you go, chat. You, I didn't. Even I missed, better. I dodged having to do it this time. So now you've got an opportunity to to get me to guzzle vegan cheese sauce. So all right, deal. Let's do it. All right. So now we can do the next one. Gotta start sorting this shit before the show starts. I tried, but I'm so bad at thinking of these. <laughs> We have ten dollars okay. from Mike B. Hashtag Team Naomi. Although I'll always secretly be Team Arden. Naomi, how do you feel about mayonnaise? I, I am absolutely opposed to Team Mayonnaise. I, I don't uh, know. I, I just go for something simpler, like like some olive oil or something, just to spice up my sandwich. No, don't need okay. a mayo. Butter's you know, also good. I, I gotta respect it though, because olive oil on a sandwich is bomb. It's so good. So I can't even be mad. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Mike B. Uh, then we've got nine ninety nine from Stacy nineteen oh four. I'm cisgender and was never happy with my breast size or nose. It was absolutely no problem for me to get both surgeries. That's discrimination. You ladies are great and fuck you, Jimmy. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Like the fact that trans women have to get a like a, a document from a professional to have a, a fucking nose job. Like if it's indicated as treating gender for dysphoria, I'm sure you could probably lie to your provider and get around that somehow but i don't think most of us want to do that i think most of us want to be straight up because like for me when i got ffs and they treated my nose i specifically told the doctor i don't want you to give me a cute little elsa button nose like i see on a lot of people who get get rhinoplasty i want you to reverse the effects of puberty on on my face like that is the, the limit of it you know and so it was like a slightly different approach to the procedure. And it's nice to be able to be honest about that with your provider when you're asking for treatment. Um, but yeah, no, it is, it is an interesting disparity between the groups. A little strange to have two entirely different health systems. And we have $10 from Jamie J. I had a loud debate with my otherwise liberal mother Tuesday. She argued people just need more time to get used to trans folks. So today I'm supporting Takis since human rights can't wait. Thank you very much, Jamie. <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot from my mom too. My mom's amazing. She's very supportive, but I think she sometimes thinks like, you know, the society will always just go in the right direction. And it's like, Jesus Christ, not without some fighting, mom. <laughs> the the end of history myth, dearly. which... Uh... <laughs> mm. Uh, ten dollars from wait, is this one me? I think yeah, Caitlin Griffin. Yes. I got a referral for top surgery, but I haven't followed through because I'm scared. Any tips for getting over the fear? Whew, that is super relatable. Um, I will say that again for me, the thing that helped alleviate the fear was looking at the evidence at what the satisfaction rates for these surgeries are, and they're overwhelmingly really positive for trans people. So it's kind of silly to think that either one of us individually would be unique in that regard, but I understand where the fear comes from. So definitely um, talk to your healthcare provider, you know, make sure that you're uh, really evaluating these things critically. Talk to people who've gotten the surgery um, that you're trying to get and make sure that uh, uh, you're, you know, that they, they have similar things to say, but by and large, ooh, uh, by and large, I think uh, if you just follow the evidence, you'll probably, uh, you know, 
a place on, I, I would take those bets on those odds is basically what I'm saying. Absolutely. I, I have not had any kind of like surgery referral, so I can't speak directly on that. But I can remember being like scared about the whether or not I would enjoy hormones after extensive research into all the effects. And, and I remember explicitly thinking, I don't see any downsides to this. All of this sounds positive and like things that I want. And I, I still had all of that doubt about it. So uh, that doubt's always going to be yeah. present. But you, you know you better than anybody else and fo follow your heart's desires, especially when you've got doctors on your side saying that, yeah, this, this seems right for you. Absolutely. Five sixty nine from Seven, Lo Seven Lions. <laughs> Welcome to Takis Naomi. Hope to see more of you on the line. Arden knows I love her, but this week I have to vote for the newcomer. Hashtag Team Naomi. Thank you so much, Seven oh, Lions. <laughs> the chat. You know, our Team Arden usually doesn't pull through it until the last like quarter <laughs> of the of the super chat portion. So I'm praying Team Arden wakes up. <laughs> <laughs> praying to Team Arden. Uh. <laughs> Oh God, my throat is so dry. I feel like rude guzzling this giant fucking bottle of Pedialyte on air, but you know, <laughs> trying to survive out here. Nine ninety nine from Stacy nineteen oh four. Oh wait, I think we just had this one. Yeah, we had this exact one already. We have and this, this one. one. Too. <laughs> yep, and this one. In that one. <laughs> Are you just going through them all on purpose now? Uh, four ninety nine from Ramona. I chose my name because I didn't know anyone who uses it, and I love the Ramones. Dumb reasons are good. Hashtag Team Arden. Hashtag Jimmy Go Pound Sand. <laughs> uh, no, that's great. I love that. Uh, Ramona is also an adorable name. I think it's great. Uh, I, there's like no rules to any of this, you know, other than like you living your best life. Which, if that means naming yourself after a band you like, then fucking great. That's the best rule. Go, go get it. Yeah. Glad I got one point on the board. You got five dollars from Nathan Arndt. I love you all. Gotta go for the underdog. Hashtag nominal Naomi. Jimmy, you're a wonderful human being. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> also remember, chat, we gotta get the total votes to 25 for any punishment to be enacted, which means you gotta get your votes in. I see there's like, I'm pretty sure there's a bunch of super chats already in, but just in case we don't have enough, I just wanna remind, remind the audience, you know? Gotta squeeze you dry. That's my job. <laughs> uh, $9.99 from Sarah Wilson. My dad on season one, episode six of the Smithsonian's America's Hidden Story says, founding father Casimir Pulaski was likely intersex. Dad says Pulaski and gay general Von Steuben shows LGBTI people helped build the U.S. I don't know anything about those people, so I don't want to speak on that because I don't want to spread information that I'm not aware of, but it's definitely a fact that uh, intersex and queer people and gay people have been around in, like, every civilization in one form or another since the dawn of humankind. So, absolutely, they were a part of the U.S., too. Just makes sense. Yeah, I don't know that exact story, but intersex people are way more common than people realize. Depending on your definition of intersex, kind of the, the loosest definition we have based off of just anybody who has mixed sex characteristics to some extent would be at a minimum about 2% of the population. And we also know that it's a roughly three quarters of intersex people don't even know that they're intersex because of how much we try to binarize sex and gender in ways that just don't even follow what's happening in objective reality. Right. Oh, man. See, and I wish we, I heard, I heard that you have a lot of takes on that from Forrest. I wish we could have uh, had some callers that were pitching in that uh, ballpark, but that's okay. We'll get it next time. We'll have you back <laughs> on for it. I would love to. Absolutely. Uh, $10 see. from The Rogue. This is Taryn. You two were in amazing health and awesome to talk. Ah, I'm so glad, Taryn. Really glad we could help like that. Yeah, so glad. Again, I feel so bad for our callers to wait for an hour and then it's a short call, but we do prioritize the spicier calls because... Generally, in my mind, I think the things that will have the biggest impact on moving society in a positive direction are the those calls where they don't necessarily already align with us. But I'm always happy to take calls from trans people on things like that. So we've got 100 RON, which I don't know what this currency is. From Ronald. Romanian Lou. 
Ronald Romanian what? L- Lou, L E U. I don't know how to pronounce it. Lou. Low. I don't Romanian fucking know. Lou. Okay. Please read my joke from chat. <laughs> uh, I I have no idea, Ashlash. What uh, I, I I wish I could, but searching chat is not that easy. Um, YouTube chat's not very forgiving, and I don't know when you sent this either. So I can can't back. find it. By the way, like I I'm searching through the entire Vmix social thing by the name, and the only thing I have is the super chat. So uh. uh no. Uh, maybe they sent it, if you are a channel member and you send it as your super chat, that gets lost. The vmix social does not like those, so if that's how you nah, send it. Nah, I don't it, think that happened either, because I, I, I went no. looking for it when it came in. Okay, it could have gotten deleted. Maybe they were saying something awful and it got deleted. <laughs> that's and probably, no. there is the possibility of a band word, but. That would have also shown up on my side because I'm in there as a mod. I just could not find it. Okay. Well, sorry. If you want to post it again, if it's not problematic, Ash, go ahead. And if it is, mods, please feel free and issuing Ash the big ban hammer. Uh, we have ten dollars from Madison. That call with Simon was so heartbreaking yet so relatable. Thank you for opening up about the experience of internalized transphobia. It's inspiring to see where you are today. Hashtag Team Arden. Well, I don't know if that's for me or for Simon, but definitely, uh, yeah, hearts out to Simon. I, you know, we get a lot of calls like that, and uh, it's it's happening to everyone. The, the, I definitely understand the the sense that the. Um, social climate is dangerous. I mean, I think there's probably more outward hostility towards trans people than there's ever been. And, you know, we're seeing, like, what is it? 400 uh, some, some odd bills that have been introduced across the legislature in the U.S. and different states. I mean, it's it's definitely bleak out here. And I don't know how, if it's the same in Germany, but um, I get it. Uh, but just, you know, in spite of all that, you're not going to stop being trans just because some politician makes accessing healthcare illegal. And I think in some sense, it is noble for us to be out here and being ourselves in spite of that, because that gives the next generation of trans people that come after us a way better shot at not having to deal with those hurdles. I mean, that's, that's what I've, that's been my mission statement. I feel like from the beginning of this show and for getting of trans activism for me has always been about, I want the next generation of trans people to have a slightly easier time than I had growing up. Um, so Absolutely. No, like I, we can, we can look back even o- older, de- older decades and generations of America when we had cross-dressing laws in place, trans people were still, were still here. They were fighting for the rights of trans people, of gay people, of all queer people and they made the next generation better for us and, and we can pay it forward to the, the future generations yet. And absolutely 100%. Absolutely. Agreed. Thank you so much, Madison. I appreciate it. Uh, I see we're trying to get Ash's comment to go through too, but I'm not sure <laughs> if it's, uh, everyone's like, let us hear the joke. <laughs> we're on the edge of our seat. Watch is going to be, something very small uh five dollars from emory king <clears throat> naomi welcome to the line you are a fabulous addition to the community arden you're great too but today i'm hashtag team naomi thank you both go fuck yourself jimmy uh <laughs> i got a little bostonian a little rhode island in me when i when i said that <laughs> uh but uh yeah so i think we're, we're we're getting near the end of the super chat so if you want to watch myself or naomi guzzle that vegan cheese you better get your votes in people we're we're, we're shaping up to to miss the uh the hurdle so far so no <laughs> don't you know we want to make fools of ourselves for you <laughs> you think i'm here it is to the look internet reasonable? after all <laughs> yeah 9.99 from joe stinkpot y'all rock joe from michigan Thank you very much, Joe. We really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks so much, Joe. You rock. Uh, whoa, a thousand Swedish Karuna. I, I don't know how much that is in the U.S., but it seems like a lot. Um, from Galaxy Man 2015, 
short time member, first time super chatter. Wow. And a generous one at that. Thank you so much. Love all the shows on the line. Hashtag team Arden and go guzzle vegan cheese, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be more torture <laughs> for Jimmy so than anyone else. It's nearly a hundred dollars. Wow. That's we appreciate insane. the one one thousand sex. Yes, the one thousand sex. <laughs> True. <laughs> Thank you so much, Galaxy Man. 499 from Dij the Second. Do I, as a gender fluid person, have a seat at the trans table when it comes to trans issues? I can question whether or not my opinions are valid here. So I think that the, the common definition of trans, which we generally use, is just somebody who identifies with a gender other than the one which you were assigned at birth. And I'm pretty sure your parents didn't designate you as gender fluid at birth. So welcome, your, your opinion and your voice is important and you are marginalized by so many of the same systems which, which hurt binary trans people, which hurt non-binary trans people, which hurt intersex people, which hurt all of it, even gender non-conforming people. And we should all be working together to tackle those issues and, and help lift us all up. Yeah, absolutely. I know we've had conversations in the past about like bisexuality and how like straight passing can like impact like privilege in certain ways. But I hope that's never come across as like, if you are straight or cis passing in some way that you don't have a seat at the table with trans issues. I agree with that. I use the same definition as Naomi. If you identify as a gender other than the one you were assigned at birth, you're trans to me and you have a seat at the table here. So definitely uh, your opinions are valid and welcome. Uh, what do we got next? Sorry, Dexter was getting in. Dexter was making a whimpering sound like he was hurting. I had to step away for a second, but oh, I hope okay. hopefully Aww. you haven't been waiting too long. <laughs> no, no, no. It was like a second. Uh, this one's for you, Naomi. Ten dollars from Jasmine Bryant. I'm super excited. A few of us at work are starting an LGBTQ plus task force, Pride Collective, yeah. and for the first time, we're going to have a booth at Capital Pride in DC. Hey, that's fantastic. Always glad to that's hear about amazing. outreach, about people putting things together. Awesome job. Awesome job. Good stuff. Yeah, that's great. Especially that it's coming from your workplace. That's got to be huge. I know like one of the, uh, when the research talks about like the people who have the biggest effect on, like their acceptance has the biggest effect on the quality of life of trans people. It's like religious leaders, parents, and employers. Like employers is a huge one. So having that at your workforce is really awesome. Texture is my oh my dog, God. you fucking weirdos. <laughs> Jimmy Sub. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> he bit him. <laughs> he was chewing on his paw. From what I can tell, he was chewing on his paw and bit himself a little too hard. Everything was fine. Oh, kitty stretch. Oh, my God. <laughs> I wish That's I could have my in his cubby over shoes. there. Oh, it's so cute. If Daphne wasn't a little demon who likes to stand on my computer and hit the power button, I would have her in here as well, but she's a little monster. I love her in spite Aww. of that. Has Matt been Maybe forgetting to close his door lately? Because didn't the other day she just come and walk across his keyboard? She does, yeah. I, I don't know if he forgets or if she gets locked in sometimes, but luckily she has three brain cells. So if she's in there and I open the door to my office, she comes sprinting out because she's like, yes, I get attention. And then I close his door. So, you know, it works. <laughs> uh, $10 from Ross Settles. Thank you so much for your support. We really appreciate it. It means a lot. Woo! Um, the, the chat poll will close at 50, 10 till. So if people who are taking the poll in the live chat to give one okay. point away, uh, we are oh, not yeah. currently trending to hit the combined 25 though. So y'all need to get them votes in. I want to watch the cheese get guzzled. <laughs> the cheese guzzle. <laughs> yeah, that goes, if people are in Naomi's chat too, we do a poll in the live chat over on YouTube where you can get a vote without having to send a super chat. So the, the chat votes and whoever has the most points at the end, that's one vote towards the, the super chat thing. Uh, chat, you must swamp it. Go swamp it. Yeah, get her those votes. <laughs> we also uh, have a $10 from Ross Settles, hashtag Naomi coin and or what is the utility of having multiple programming languages? Heck aside, thanks for educating a Midwest dummy like me. Jimmy, go fuck yourself. Are we doing the oh, Naomi yeah. Quinn computer science facts? 
<laughs> Do I it. mean, we Go weren't, but but if you want to answer the question, I'm interested in the answer. Yeah, I'm yeah. Curious, I don't so know there are there's a couple different utilities, of, specifically with different programming languages. Um, kind of just like different programming styles is a pretty obvious one. Uh, different people like different environments for different reasons. Some programming languages are a lot nicer just to get like hit the ground running, get things up and running very quick. Uh, others are are better for more kind of like long term development, testing, efficiency, that kind of thing. Different programming languages are going to have different kind of pros and cons. Uh, one kind of like really good example I can give you is the difference between programming languages which uh, make you manage memory by yourself versus programming languages that automate memory management. So something like C or C++ is going to require you to manage memory, to delete pointers when you're no longer using uh, dynamic memory. But something like Python is going to take care of all that for you. And so when you have languages that take care of memory management for you, one of the downsides of that is that it has to stop the world and as in stop the program from running in order to manage that memory automatically. And we can think of a couple applications where this would be uh, game over. For example, if I was writing code for a, a pacemaker in, that's trying to make sure that somebody's heart is beating and, and functioning, if that program has to stop the world to do memory collection, memory management, that could kill somebody. So this would be an example where we would have to use a manual memory management language like C++. Uh, and there are lots of other examples of different factors that programming languages have that are going to make them either mandatory or more suited for certain kind of uh, environments and tasks. Uh, great question, by the way. Yeah, that was super interesting. Uh, <laughs> cool. Thank you so much, Ross, for getting Naomi to talk about something very interesting that she knows a lot about. <laughs> cool. Woo! Uh, at Sarah Wilson Green tier. Sorry, or... no, this one's on accident. Oh. This one's not supposed to be here. This one. Okay. Uh, Ten dollars <laughs> and Larry Fishman. Thanks, Larry, longtime supporter of the channel. I'm pretty sure I first saw the name. I'll eventually choose on a map of Antarctica. Oh, oh, okay. It took me a long time to connect those pieces. I see what you mean. Yeah, awesome. I mean, I'd be a little bit careful about like why things are named certain ways i mean i wouldn't want to like be appropriating something that might be kind of inappropriate but like if you've done your research and it seems cool then awesome have a five dollars from jacqui andronicos starting my cypro today for three months before starting estrogen my endo takes a slow ramp up approach for hrt thoughts love you both hashtag arden oof i I mean, there's utility to a slow ramp up approach, right? But I will tell you, it is definitely frustrating and you're going to feel like nothing's happening for a really long time. And so I I've never seen someone do three months of androgen suppression before starting estrogen. I've usually seen them doing like two milligrams of estrogen tablets as like a ramp up, like starting with a really, really low dose alongside uh, androgen suppression. So, um... I mean, your doctor probably has, it's probably a valid approach, but I, I, you're also valid in being maybe frustrated or not liking it. There are different ways of handling it. Um, but I think generally a ramp up approach is pretty common. Most providers are going to do some sort of slow ramp up. Yeah, I, I think that I've definitely seen some advantages in the medical literature of this kind of ramp up approach, but generally that would start with starting antiandrogens and a low dose of estrogen at the same time, and then slowly upping up to, to higher doses of estrogen. Just what's most important here is making sure to get your levels checked with your endocrinologist or, or ordering blood tests. Um, sometimes you might even want to order blood tests on your own just to make sure that you're, you're getting these hormones in the right kind of range because uh, sometimes often as a trans person, you need to know a lot about trans healthcare too, just to make sure that you're getting the best kind of care you can. So definitely monitor your hormone levels, and uh, there is some some good effects of the of the ramp up approach. Specifically, if you're trying to mimic the natural development which uh, cis females go through in their puberty, so that can help with things like getting the the most natural kind of style of like breast growth, for example. Uh, Naomi wins the poll point. We only oh, have nice. like four, maybe five. I think it's four though votes. So we need at least 10 more $5 super chats with votes attached that haven't been sent yet. In other words, to make somebody guzzle this cheese. Well, okay. Right. I didn't like the way that sounded coming out, but guzzles cheese. Guzzle this cheese. Yeah. That, this made it too personal and <laughs> yeah. weird for me. Yeah, this, this was the, the, the bad word there. <laughs> it is forgiven. Get those hashtags in your in your super chat. 
five euros from Mismatched. I normally voted for Arden, but Naomi looks like she could be my younger, cuter sister. So I'm going to have to oh. go with hashtag Team Naomi this time around. <laughs> Thanks, Mismatched. Appreciate it. Very sweet. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> We have a $5 from Zakian. I created my name for the fantasy novel I've been working on since I was a kid. It means wind in one of the languages and I fell in love with it. That's so awesome. I, I love it when most trans people I've talked to have a story behind their name and I think that's really cool. And you sound like you have a very lovely personal story, which that's fantastic. I love to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. Extra cool. Thanks, Zakian. All right, how we do? We got 1999 from Stasia Flonase. I could use some Flonase right now. I am congested as hell. <laughs> oh, that, that's what that does, right? <laughs> uh, I'm a huge fan of the show in the chat and the mods. Yeah, our mods are the fucking bomb. I got cookies, Dylan Fuller, uh, Ilya, uh, 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 a critical cupcake, all of them. You guys are so amazing. There's so many I missed too, but I love you all. You guys are doing such a great job. Um, Hashtag Team Arden. Hashtag Go Fuck Yourself, Jimmy. What did I do to deserve that? What if I just start acting you like know I what forgot? You did. That'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, you know what you did. That's true. I've been over multitasking from... this time. Sorry, I'll <laughs> shut up. Nine ninety nine from Nickel Us. People are free to make decisions they may later regret. Physical, financial, relationships, career outcomes are rarely, if ever, a hundred percent certain for anyone. I, I don't think you can make the claim that outcomes are 100% certain, certain for anything. Um, and and yeah. we know that, like, especially if we're talking about medical decisions, uh, one of the examples that I tend to go through is LASIK eye surgery, which has more than twice the regret rate. A, a conservative estimate of the regret rate of LASIK eye surgery is more than twice the most liberal estimate of regret for bottom surgery. So you, you can use lasers to shape somebody's eyes in order to help them see better without glasses. And more people regret that than rearranging their genitals. Crazy stuff. Um, but you don't see anybody doing this kind of fear-mongering about LASIK eye surgery. But you totally could construct these exact same kind of conservative fear-mongering narratives about how they're damaging, mutilating perfectly healthy eyes with lasers and destroying body parts. And it's something that helps people, as does bottom surgery. And, and that's okay. That's so true. That, that's what really gets me the most, is I'm totally comfortable for a conversation on, like, you know, uh, how we go about making diagnoses and, and the, the risk benefit analysis that we take before we do a treatment or something. But that's not what the conversation ever is. Because if that was true, we would be talking about LASIK and like prostatectomies and things like this, but we don't talk about those. We're always talking about trans healthcare, which clearly shows that it's like, this is a very specific bias that people have about trans healthcare specifically, not about protecting children or reservations about medical procedures in general. Yeah. Thanks, Nicholas. I appreciate that. Nicholas. Uh, then we've got, I see a few more came in swooping in there. Uh, <laughs> so next we've got $20 from Light Halcyon. Sorry, I missed the calls portion part. Has anyone asked Naomi what her favorite dinosaur is yet? No. What is your favorite dinosaur? Oh, I, I, I like uh, I like Littlefoot from The Land Before Time. He's a good dinosaur. Oh, that's great. I love I love Deinonychus. The 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 fully the only fully intact one is that um a fossil is at a, a, the New York Natural History Museum. I'm forgetting what the name of it is, but it's adorable. Ooh. Cute little feathered monster. I just want to kiss it. I love lizards. I've got fifty snakes and four lizards in our house, so <laughs> it's like. My favorite thing ever. Four ninety nine from Coffee Mom. Life would be a lot simpler if everyone understood and accepted that biology is messy. Hashtag Team Arden. Naomi, you're amazing. Jimmy, go fuck yourself. So <laughs> true. I, I I know that like another one that really comes up when when you start talking to biologists, even the notion of a species is not clear in like any kind of sense. Where trying to delineate species gets messy and complicated. And, and yet people that think they know a lot about biology think that something as complicated as, as sexual dimorphism would be simpler than like speciation. Yeah. It's a sp particularly egregious when it comes from someone like, you know, I'm going to anger, anger his stance right now, but like Richard Dawkins, you know, a renowned biologist who's like talks about evolution and should 
understand that like the line from where humans became like homo sapiens what we are now is not clear so why on earth would sexual dimorphism fall on these clear black and white lines it's ridiculous that he has somehow become a biological essentialist person but the the propaganda man it just hits you so hard <laughs> don't worry you won't anger his stands they're not watching this that's true that's <laughs> true but i mean they have gotten mad before that's how i got that one debate with t-jump was because the fucking i was vocal about dawkins but you know by the way i will be <laughs> isolating that to jimmy go fuck yourself so true because that's what naomi just said nice but then was <laughs> something else yeah i'm just gonna clip it in is this one for me sorry i talked in the last one i think, I think it's for that. you okay a uh, hundred swedish krona from galaxy one two one again and that's also like a lot of money right uh or is that ten dollars I, I have a hard time understanding. uh yeah, yeah it's about 10 bucks naomi Hashtag team have programming. Yes, that is definitely a team, Naomi. <laughs> nice. Thank you so much for your support. That's crazy. We have 669 Canadians from Rebuswind. Love Naomi so much. Would be team Naomi if Arden is not here. However, Arden is here. So team Arden. Ooh, he had me, had me right on the edge of my chair the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Rebus does that a lot. Thank you so much. We appreciate you and your committed support to Team Arden. Uh, $5 from Troy Thulu. I'm going to select my permanent chosen name from a book by author Charlie Jane Anders, Victories Greater Than Death. Hashtag Team Arden. Awesome. I'm not familiar, mm -hmm. so... Sorry, I, I don't usually check emails during quirk, but I just got a sponsorship <laughs> offer from a personal injury attorney, and I'm very confused. I don't I don't know. I'll, we'll, have, we'll have to talk about it after. Interesting. But what a weird, what a, what, yeah, our channel. That makes sense. I wonder if this is from my channel or this channel. Jesus Christ, how strange. They, they think that your health line, not the line. $10 right. from Game Master Flash. Always be a good ally. Go fork yourself, Jimmy. Hashtag Team Naozi. Naomi, because I want to see Arden guzzle that cheese. For a friend, of course. <laughs> right on. <laughs> I will gladly guzzle the cheese. I mean, hey, if YouTube's content restriction wasn't so horrible, I I'll do it for the content. I would make it so salacious, but, you know, YouTube's going to hit us <laughs> with the strikes or whatever, so. Thanks, Game Master. The fun thing about this is we could, well, I guess we do it next time. I guess we would do it next time Naomi's on with you, right? Because there's a version of this where you, I, I almost think we should just have you and uh, Josie drink them together at the same time. <laughs> we probably could do that. I, I'd be fine with that. I'll do I'd it be twice. Fine. Who cares? <laughs> uh, 50 Ron again from Ashlash. Go fuck yourself, Jimmy. Team Arden. <laughs> Woot. I'll take it. This was the person uh, with the joke, that, right? Yeah, we still we never got the joke. Where's the joke? <laughs> we'll never know. At this point, I think it's better for us to not know, you know? I, I don't want to ruin the, the suspense anymore. It's, it's better not knowing. <laughs> we have a $5 from Jacqui Andronicos. Yeah, the Cypro for three months was to see the effects of lower testosterone separate to starting estrogen then mimic the start of cis puberty. Hashtag Naomi. Oh, gotcha. That was talking about the, the uh, mimicking kind of the slower onset of estrogen convo from earlier. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, I wish you the best of luck because I definitely struggled with the pill form of estrogen, which is like usually what they start you with. But I think it's probably good for at least the first like a year or so to start with that one. I uh, really get that slow build up. Uh, then we've got 500 Swedish Krona. Wow, Galaxy Man, you are single-handedly funding Transatlantic. Thank you so much. Uh, can this one count for 10 votes rather than putting 10, 50 uh, Krona votes? Uh, 50 Krona votes. Hashtag Team Arden. We had talked about that before. Yeah, I already, I already in chat, I basically said, I'll split the difference with you this time and I'll give you five. 
but usually no. Okay. So the math of 25 combined is actually based not on 25 times five. Like it, it, it's based on what the average vote ends up going for in most shows. Uh, so if we change things to $5 per vote or per a vote per $5 rather, one, everything gets way more difficult when people use foreign currencies. I, I would wow. have to every time make the conversion uh, and hope that I got it right. And then two, we would have to change the combined total from 25 to something else. So right. that's that's <laughs> why we don't do that. But I'll give you five this Galaxy time. Galaxy Man really wants to see me guzzle some cheese. <laughs> Working hard for it. Uh, thank you so much, Galaxy Man. Five dollars from Alyssa Nguyen. I'll always have a soft spot in my heart for 32-bit x86 assembly. Hashtag team CompSci, hashtag team MASM, hashtag team Naomi. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh gosh, assembly. I, oh, assembly's messy. I'm not a big fan. <laughs> Wish I understood. Uh, we did hit the, the thing now. So now it's a matter of who, who comes out first. So definitely team Ooh. Naomi and team Arden. Be, be ready to fight now because it's happening. $5 from real person. <laughs> team Arden, although never Mayo. Okay, again, I have to explain. I am not like a mayo advocate. I'm just not a mayo hater. That's all. I, I can enjoy some mayo. I'm not like, you've got to try mayo. <laughs> it's not me. It happens when you're the strongest mayo supporter on the panel. It's true. I, I've become associated with mayo. <laughs> $10 from Tim Gill. You can't make Arden eat vegan cheese. She's sick and hasn't even seen her chiropractor yet. You gotta get those chakras realigned. This this is because yesterday on the hangup, there was a caller who was talking about um, their family trying to make them see a Cairo, even though it wasn't going to help them at all. It's just because they believed in the woo part of Cairo. So uh, uh, chatters were making jokes about that today, that I'm sick because I haven't seen a Cairo. <laughs> okay, I have to try this. I'm gonna Google something. Chiropractic gender dysphoria. Oh God. Ooh. You have gender dysphoria because your spine is wait, what is it? Is it sublimated or something like that? Yeah. My wait, uh <laughs> have you tried seeing a chiropractic about your a chiropractor about your there's a Reddit thread. Have you tried Horses. seeing a chiropractor about your gender dysphoria? Uh, boy, I'll be interested to check this out later. But the results are great. The, <laughs> I'll say the first results were actually like, tr it seemed to be guides of like how to not be a sack of shit chiropractor if someone comes in with gendered, like gender dysphoria, like how to treat them and, and stuff. And that's actually, I mean, the whole thing's obviously, not the whole thing, but most of chiropractic is wooey bunk that started with like a literal... Uh, uh, cult, not a joke. Yeah. It started as a cult, uh, but it is nice that they're tr you know trying, trying to not to distress people's dysphoria. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, most of the people who I know who are into chiropractic now are actually kind of like lefties who are like into like body work and like uh, that that kind of like oh woo. So it's, it's, it's a huge not, Mormon like, thing though. Like oh, chiro okay. tons of Mormons go to chiropractors before the doctor for anything. And mm. it's like a huge Mormon career. If you go to Utah, like everybody's a chiropractor. I, did you watch that, <laughs> that Andrew so Garfield mo uh, series on Hulu? I keep, I always forget what it's called, but it, it's, no. it's a, it's based on a true story story about these murders that happened in Utah uh, years ago. And he plays a detective whose faith basically gets deconstructed during the investigation. Uh, and the family that is responsible for the murder is like a prominent Mormon family of chiropractors. Like that. And it, that part's uh, true. Yeah. It's fucking wild. So interesting. The way that like some beliefs will lead into others. I mean, like I know you've said this with Mormonism before. I think I've heard you say, and it's true when I, where I grew up was like the, non-denominational but we practiced like pentecostals we were really into uh essential oils like that kind of stuff was like a really big fucking Ooh. deal and it's like oh my god come on people in cults love to join more cults 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they got all the secret info. Did we already read did this we... one? Am I? Are you waiting on me? I don't think I we don't did read this one. It was 660 oh. Canadian from Rebus Wind going to visit China in the next month. Maybe I'll try to call you guys from China so I can say, Jimmy, go fuck yourself in China. Hashtag <laughs> sus Chinese spy call. <laughs> thank you, Rebus Wind. <laughs> yes, thanks, Rebus. <laughs> That's funny. Five dollars from Larry Fishman. Hashtag Team Naomi. I don't want to hurt uh, to Arden hurt herself again. Well, I don't think I would hurt myself on vegan cheese, but I appreciate the concern. ESAD to me. What does that one stand for? Eat sand. I think it's eat shit and die. But oh, eat shit and die. Larry's uh, nice. I, I know Larry doesn't mean it. <laughs> I think I think Larry's just trying to escalate the insult, Jimmy, instead of. But maybe right. we won't go with the and die ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And die is a little extreme. But appreciate it, Larry. Thanks. What else we got going on? We got $5 from Kane D. In my experience, transphobes aren't interested in learning actual science. Ironic since they love saying facts over feelings. Cry laugh emoji. Hashtag team Arden. Yeah, very true. Uh, I mean, it's fun to point out like where their beliefs are inconsistent with themselves. That's like my favorite thing to do. But yeah, the second you try to present them with any actual science, they usually will say, well, you know, I don't trust that specific study or academia as a whole is unreliable. But then when they try to back up their beliefs, they'll usually use like fraudulent studies. So it's like, or not fraudulent, but like studies that aren't reliable and don't actually lead to any valid conclusions. So it's like, Oh, so dishonest. It's not that academia has a left-wing bias, it's that reality has a left-wing bias. Yup, true. <laughs> so true. I just thought of another argument for one point per no matter how much it is. It also prevents the rich from buying the outcomes. Uh, and so I'm just saying the reason why we don't do more votes for larger donations is uh, that's the most socialist way to do it. I mean, if this one if this one goes to Arden, then I can just claim the election was rigged by that that five votes you gave her. That one, that one with the True. five, yeah, yeah, yeah. True. I I think the person was expressing that they were willing to do it in multiple separate votes, and that's why I split the difference. <laughs> but yeah, I'll, this is uh, what if we win within the difference of five, I will also do the cheese next time you're here. I'll just <laughs> we'll I'll commit to it. It's fine. I'm realizing we'll though too. Draw. We should honestly be arranging for whatever these things are and should do similar stuff on some of the other shows. We should be arranging these as YouTube shorts because I feel like this would be an amazing way to get people to come check out the channel. That's true. That's a really mm. good idea. Yeah. Somebody, yeah, like uh, if that. some sort of assistant producer would write down that idea or something, that would be <laughs> fucking amazing. Yeah. Do you think yes, an assistant producer should do that to me? I'll, if, I'll let I don't know. know. If, if that happened, it'd be amazing though. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, 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 okay, okay. <laughs> I love you so much as a human. I love you too. But mostly as a subordinate. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. That was so we have, <laughs> we have a $10 from Light Halcyon. Forgot to vote last time. Hashtag Team Naomi. If we don't make her drink vegan cheese, maybe she'll come back. Bottom emoji. <laughs> Bottom emoji? Drew. You all know what it is. <laughs> It's How true. You're dare not wrong. you? <laughs> I <laughs> years ago, I literally had somebody. I I sent that in response to something. They're like, "Oh shit, are we about to?" And I was like, "What?" They're like, "That's uh, that's the bottom energy emoji," and I I reject it. That emoji sometimes that emoji conveys something that no other emoji conveys. So yeah, bottom energy. No, bottom. oh, oh yeah. are you shitting me? You think there aren't other bottom emo bottom energy emojis? That shit's oh, easy. This you one is just, just indistinguishable. <laughs> <laughs> Did Thanks, I get the point? I can't remember if I gave it. Let's say Give no and make it a tie to make it dramatic. Caution, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> True. Uh, four ninety nine from Rosina Keller. Power PC ABI for the win. I just said words. I don't know what they meant. That's okay. Cool. I love words. We have five euros from DIY Patrick. 
Simon's call was so relatable. Seemingly lots of people around me, including my best friend, are kind of anti-trans. Hashtag teams Naomi. Yeah, it's, it's really sad to see to see the shift in people. And, you know, it would just be nice if, if people could just, like, love each other and support them and be cool if people want to express themselves in different ways. I think a lot of those people, though, are like that one caller who was from Arizona. I can't remember her name. And she said, like, oh, but I see a lot of FTMs who regret transition. And it's like, no, you don't. You just have watched conservative news because that's your community and that's what you've heard. That's not actually real. That's propaganda. Um, but yeah, it does suck. It's like so commonplace. Thanks, DIY Patrick. We got 10 euros from Andrew Batea. I'd love to hear Naomi's thoughts on the Rust programming language. Hashtag Team Arden, hashtag Jimmy, go seg fault yourself. <laughs> A psych fault is like a type of computer program crash. Um, ah, so I I have not programmed in Rust before, but I've seen some stuff on it, and in particular with like memory safety. Uh, I'll definitely like need to check it out and try it myself. So um, would love to hear more from people that are that are really in on Rust. Uh, uh, it seems like a wonderful really language, oh. and I, I think that particularly programming types are wanting to adopt it more and more. What the fuck just Ooh, happened? I yeah. Wait. Oh, is the storm hitting you, Jimmy? Is that what's going on? No. That everything's fine. We're, are we still on air? We're on air, right? Yeah, I think we're on air. That Surely we must be. What the Ooh. fuck was that? Hang on. We let's just hit see. a huge hiccup. I thought Naomi disconnected again, but it was not that because then I realized I wasn't moving either, and I was like, "Oh no, what's <laughs> happened?" Or right, yeah, hopefully we're still on air because I'm still finding out if we're still on air. Uh, oh I goodness. don't have a DNA. How am I talking to you if we're not on air? I no, can't. No, no, we're we're on air. I just found it. We're we're good. Okay, let's try and get through these maybe kind of quick then because I don't know yep. if we're gonna still be. It says I don't have internet no. on my end, which is fucking whack. Okay, so let yeah let let's hammer through these real fast. Okay. Uh oh, we know we're yeah, both it's not, cheese. It's not moving these. It's not moving these to the thing either. Something's all fucked up. Oh no. Okay, I'm gonna do a oh, quick no. Dragon's Fourth Child says if you haven't built an 8-bit Game Boy, you haven't lived at all. Still Team Arden. Uh oh, there it finally went. Okay. That one appeared. Okay, maybe okay. I will be on someday to call in and then you can read these real quick. Let's be awesome. let's be fast before it all fucking dies. 999. Sorry, I don't remember go, who was who, so it, I just it. <laughs> uh, When you go to a chiropractor, ignore all the woo. Treat it as no more than you would treat in getting a massage but without the tip. Uh, I, gen I mean, I feel like that's like going to an astrologist and getting what you want out of it. I, I don't really like that, but there are non-woo things at chiropractors, I understand. Yes. They were right twice a day. Yes. A hundred DKKs from Mad Shits. DKK better than sex. Hashtag Team Naomi. Is that like Danish or something? I, I don't want to start an international incident. We probably should not. <laughs> uh, we shouldn't take a side there. There. Five pounds from Colin. Thanks for the show. I admire what you do. I need your help and you need mine. It was a nice sentiment I heard recently. Hashtag Team of No Team. Wow. That's it. Consider We're tied. Classic. We're ending on a tie. And so you're both going to guzzle, Ooh. right? All right, we'll both do the cheese challenge. <laughs> I love it. Well, oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Naomi. Would you like to do a last chance to like plug all your stuff before we say goodbye and wrap up? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I am nominal.naomi. You can Google that and you will find all my content. I, I do leftist debates kind of convos and talk about queer rights over on Twitch and YouTube and TikTok. I'm actually live on Twitch right now. We'll be streaming for a little bit longer. So you're going to go check out the stream after the show. Go check me out twitch.tv slash nominal Naomi. We will be live for a little bit longer. I would love to have you in my chat. I put the awesome. link in the in the live chat if y'all want to go and follow uh, follow over to uh, to the Twitch. Uh, Arden, reminder that when we end the show, if we keep talking, we will be live on Twitch. So don't talk all the shit you usually talk about me after. <laughs> right. I, I'll resist. We'll definitely go follow Naomi on all those things. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate having you. You are an awesome co-host. We'd love to have you here. And we'd love to have you back again soon. Thank you to you, the viewers, who make the show possible. We wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for you guys. And thanks to the mods and to Jimmy and to everyone who makes this whole whole machine work. We really love you guys. We will see you all next week. Bye.